Uh, welcome to Standing Committee on City Policy and Strategic Priorities, meeting of March 30th, 2023, reconvening from March 29th, 2023. Uh, this committee meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, the City of Vancouver Electronic Meetings, and as such, committee members may participate in person or by electronic means. If a council member attending by electronic means loses connection during the voting process, team members are available to get you back online quickly while the voting process is suspended. The team member's contact information has been circulated to you. Video of council members speaking, presentations, and vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. Council members participating virtually are reminded that in accordance with Section 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, members must enable their video to confirm quorum. Any council member whose video is disabled will be marked absent for that portion of the meeting. Any comments on agenda items can be sent to council using the web form on the city's website, and the link to that form will be tweeted out on Van City Clerk. I would like to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and team members, we will avoid using gendered honorifics and will instead refer to the person by their first and last name, role, or title. I would also like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. We thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also would like to take a moment to recognize the immense contributions of the City of Vancouver team members who work hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work and play. In case of an emergency, if we need to evacuate the building, I would like to direct your attention to the exits. There are two exits located beyond the glass doors and to the left. If these exits are obstructed, please direct your attention to the four exits in the chamber. And please use the stairs, not the elevator, <clears throat> in case of emergency. I would also like to highlight that there is a defibrillator located at the end of the hallway outside the council chamber. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Sim? Councillor Carr? Councillor Kirby Young is on a leave of absence for civic business from 3 to 5 p.m. Councillor Dominato. Councillor Bly is on a leave of absence. Councillor Boyle. Councillor Fry. Councillor Montague. Councillor Classen. Councillor Meisner in the chair. Councillor Joe. Present. You have quorum, Chair Meisner. Thank you. Uh, plan for the day. On March 29, 2023, Council completed items 1, 3, uh, 2, 6, 9, and heard a staff presentation. I'm just going to repeat that. Completed items 1, 3, to 6, and 9, uh, and heard a staff presentation, asked questions of staff, and heard from speakers on item 2. Today, we will begin with the debate and decision on item 2, and continue with items 7, 8, 10, to 13. We will recess for dinner at 5 p.m., and reconvene at 5.30, unless there are any objections. Should the business not be completed this evening, uh, the meeting will reconvene on April 4th at 3 p.m. Finally, I'd like to remind council members that if our amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduces them. Please ensure the clerk has received your amendment by using the council meeting's DL mailing list. And before we begin, I would like to remind speakers that they have up to five minutes to make their comments, should state whether they are in support or opposition of the recommendations, and may only speak once. Committee members have up to three minutes to ask questions of speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it's not indicated on our speakers list. Following the last speaker on the speaker's list for each item, we will go back through the list for those who were not present when their name was initially called. And finally, I'd like to advise Council that as we have, uh, quote, bare quorum, uh, end quote, uh, for six, after 6 p.m. today, uh, Councillors should remain in the chamber or if participating virtually have your camera on at all times during tonight's proceedings. If we lose quorum, we'll take a short break until we can achieve quorum again with six members present. And if people need bathroom breaks during that time, please let me know. Um, 
So council, as I mentioned, finished hearing from speakers on item two, Broadway active transportation lanes, next steps last night. Would someone like to move a motion? Okay. Okay, Councillor Boyle moving recommendation B. Thank you. Council, is there any discussion? Councillor Boyle? Um, thanks. I uh, have a lot to say. I'll try to make it brief. Um, we heard from many uh, very articulate speakers yesterday and a whole um, range of experiences from small business owners, families, uh, health professionals, academics, um, seniors, cycling advocates. Uh, we've heard from, from scooter and micromobility folks too. What is really clear is that building safe active transportation lanes improves road safety for everyone. Uh, and we heard very clearly that it increases active transportation use, especially for families, for seniors, and for women. Um, in the conversation around the Broadway plan, walkability was a big priority, and having safe active transportation infrastructure improves walkability too, because it keeps micromobility and bicycles off of the sidewalks um, and in a protected space keeps them out of car lanes and, and makes the uh, drive less stressful for vehicles too. Um, we're already seeing increased scooter, e-bike, and micromobility use among residents as well as couriers and delivery workers and other people who work in the area. So adding this infrastructure also keeps workers safe. Um, the time to do this is now, not a few years from now when we've rebuilt the station blocks, uh, not after we've added street parking back in, not after more collisions, and definitely not 20 years down the road. Um, we can and should keep finding patio and public space, uh, utilizing setbacks along Broadway and more. I was actually particularly intrigued to hear that the Vancouver Public Space Network um, who, whose existence is about advocating for public gathering space, wrote in support of active transportation lanes because they too see the benefit in terms of uh, safe gathering spaces for people. I think it's worth um, mentioning that cities all over the world are making much more bold changes than even this to prioritize active transportation. And as a result, are seeing very clearly what we heard from Dr. Melissa Lem yesterday, that if you build it, they will ride. Um, safe active transportation on Broadway could happen within our term. Uh, and I feel really strongly that if we don't build it now, we will regret it. It's a major question of the type of city that we want to create and a test of the vision and leadership of this council. Um, I'm going to pause for there, uh, there for now. Okay. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Carr. Uh, yes, I'm going to speak in support of, uh, of uh, the alternative recommendation B, which has been moved. Um, and I, you know, we just want to first start by saying that um, I was so impressed by the speakers, and they were very inspiring. Uh, so thank, thank you to all the speakers who did come out. Um, obviously, they, they gave us, I think, the real reasons why we should be supporting um, recommendation B. Um, everything from this is about, you know, climate action, it's about healthy city, it's good for business. Um, we need a complete street, a safe street, um, a AAA um, active transportation street. If we build it, people will come. Uh, there will be, there will be more people. Um, the, uh, Dale Bracewell said, uh, uh, it's so important to do this now. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, uh, healthier, more women, children, families, you know, that, that will use it because they need the safety of um, a triple A on all ages, all abilities, um, bike route. Uh, we heard a lot about how the current um, alternatives that are there, whether they're 7th, 8th Avenue or 10th Avenue, are not doing the job they need to to bring people to them. There's a lot of issues around safety. I love the, you know, how many um, uh, vertical meters uh, was climbed by uh, by one of the speakers by going up and down between Broadway and, and, uh, and 10th Avenue. Um, uh, that uh, and, and that when people travel on those routes, they don't stop and shop and eat on Broadway. And that's what 
part of a complete street is getting people there that are going to use the stores and the and the business businesses. Um, so back to why it's important to do this now. Why is a, not the answer, but B is, I really, um, really believe uh, uh, the, what Dale Bracewell said, which is pulling this, doing it now pulls people into the future. It gets them active, actively using um, the non-car non um, active transportation um, modes. Um, it's a pragmatic reason. We're, the street is torn up now, and uh, to think about waiting, and we don't know how long that waiting is, but waiting to then tear it up again, I have to believe that that's going to cost more money, um, plus the delay gives uncertainty. I was at an event this week, and they were, people were talking about this, uh, this project, and, and said to me, if you're a business, you don't want uncertainty. You don't want to know that um, sometime in the next period of time, this street is going to get torn up again to replace whatever is there and then do the bike lanes. So not only will it cost more money, it will absolutely be detrimental um, to businesses and that security of knowing their street gets done, done, finished, and they can invest and, uh, and profit from that, in, that investment. Um, so I, I, um, uh, I really think that um, uh, that, that is uh, probably one of the most um, important reasons for us to proceed with B. Um, I've also never seen a letter from a BC cabinet minister saying, please do this now. Not only that, this is George Heyman, not only that, here's how you can apply for grant money from the province to help you in this endeavor. Um, so uh, for all those reasons, as I say, I think this is absolutely, uh, we need to move on this now. It, we know we need to head into this future. We have to not just shift cars from being uh, gas guzzlers to electric. More cars on the road is not the future that we want. It is a future where we are, you, where people are living in compact neighborhoods, on com in complete neighborhoods, can walk, cycle, roll to where they need to meet their, me their needs, and that our streets. And I must say, I just got so inspired by this when I was recently in Copenhagen to see just the majority of people using active transportation in every aspect of their daily lives. So. Those are my reasons, and I really hope that we that we move forward with this now. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Councillor Montague. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm actually just, um, we can put me down the list. I'm just preparing an amendment here. It's going to take me just a couple of seconds. Sure. Yeah, we can go to the next speaker. Uh, Councillor Joe. Okay, so, you know, first I'd like to appreciate the staff for putting this report together. I know this is only 15 pages, but um, there are countless of months of the uh, time, effort, knowledge, data modeling, evaluation, and back and forth. So really appreciate your contribution. Uh, so to me, I think to make this decision, workability is the most important factor I would like to consider. So because of the SkyTrain and uh, the rapid transit, also, as the stats quoted by the staff yesterday, 60% of the people identify walking experience is the top priority. So we should really design a street for accessibility and focus on pedestrian experience with cycling routes just adjacent, patios, street furniture, trees. So that leaves my decision with only option one or option three. I really trust the professional evaluation and the knowledge from the city staff as summarized in the uh, table one here. So uh, from this qualitative evaluation, option one, two items will be significantly better with no other item getting worse. But option three, seven items will be significantly worse and it costs $20 million more, plus 15% reduction in vehicle volume but almost 70% reduction in capacity because, you know, the number of lanes reduced from six to two. So I think with these facts, my decision is pretty obvious. I think we are all on the same page of the uh, encouraging people to leave their cars, uh, taking public transit, biking and walking. The question here is, 
do we need a bike lane on this arterial road now? Especially given the fact that a well-structured bike lane already exists on 10th and 7th. It's not like 10 blocks away. It's literally one block or even less depending on where you go. So also, I think, I think as, as we all know, Broadway is very unique with all different trucks, transport vehicles, loading deliveries, and emergency vehicles. So, you know, I want to reiterate, option one is not against back lane. It is not. It is actually leave the possibility open for future back lane when more data evidence are collected. There are so many uncertainties on Broadway due to potential development. We don't know exactly how Broadway will evolve in three years, five years, or 10 years. So I know people saying that we need to make bold decisions, but I think we should make right decision here, prudent decision with evidence base to support because it affects so many people. When we made a wrong decision now that we regret in the future, it costs too much if we have to re undo the back lane and bear with the impact. So I think option one will be done in a way that allows future back lane once timing, once the timing, planning, traffic evaluation, and funding all properly in place. So in fact, as what staff mentioned yesterday, this is what uh, the St. Denis Street in Montreal did. So, you know, also I want to mention that I'm really keen to support uh, the creative and the bold idea of this three-lane option. So I support a pilot project with a bike lane available on the, uh, on the street first. Uh, so I guess with that, I am uh, support uh, staff's rec recommendation, recommendation A, I think. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Joe. Uh, Councillor Montague. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I've... Uh... Circulated uh, an amendment to the clerks. I think okay, everyone's. Yeah. I'm just going to move you to the amendment queue here. Uh, please go ahead, Councillor. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I think for everybody, it's just uh, a strike of uh, the alternative B uh, and replace with the staff recommendation A. Uh, no wording changes. Just uh, um, just a strike and replace. Um, and I guess. First of all, I want to say I think staff did a great job of preparing the report. I know there was a ton of work that only goes into providing the report to, to council and to the public, but uh, all the prep work that goes into this uh, vision for the future of Broadway. Um, I, I know it's hard to imagine Broadway is a great street because right now, honestly, it's a crappy one. Um, I, I, think it's, that's, I think that's part of the challenge here is that uh, there's lots of unknowns. We just simply don't know exactly what this is going to look like when reconstruction of Broadway begins and the subway is completed. Um, I listened to all the speakers, uh, and what I was listening for was compelling arguments, not just personal opinions. And I, I wanted to address, instead of addressing all, everything that came up yesterday, I just want to address something specifically. Uh, something that came up on a regular basis was the safety concerns. Um, I think most people know my background, uh, 28 years with the VPD and five years of that spent as a collision investigator. So uh, I'm well aware of uh, what happens uh, when we mix pedestrians and cyclists and vehicles on the road, um, the potential uh, for uh, horrific crashes, uh, life altering and life ending crashes. Um, so I heard a lot of people say that if we don't put, if we don't put a bike lane in, uh, we don't care about people's safety, and I, I want to just say that that's simply not the case. Uh, I can tell you wholeheartedly that safety is a top priority, not just for me, but I think for everyone here on council. Um, but to go into it and try and explain uh, all the safety aspects uh, when it comes to um, traffic safety is I, I'd need much more than the five minutes that I have to speak here in council, other than to say that safety is, is a top priority for me. Uh, it, it's uh, it's something that I, I um, uh, it's something that I, I think is extremely important. So uh, obviously, uh, I want to go with the staff recommendation, uh, and I just want to say that th that the safety aspect of it was something that I thought about uh, carefully. Um, uh, but I think that at this point in time. The staff recommendation is the right recommendation. 
um, until the Broadway subway is completed and we have a better concept and a better idea as to really what this street is going to look like. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. Um, this is not surprising, uh, but I will just start by saying, you, you know, comes as no surprise to folks here that I feel incredibly strongly about this. Um, this is an important moment. Uh, and in our term of governing, um, we have a limited number of these moments where we are making a very clear decision um, about planning for the future or, um, or moving backwards. I see that uh, we are not going to be planning for a bold future here. I, I hear all of the, the um, what I will call excuses and spin here. We're going to add parking back. We're going to have a gradual approach. Broadway is going to remain a crappy street for a while. Um, and it's going to continue to be unsafe for scooters and bikes uh, for, for quite a while. I bike these routes every week. I don't need someone to explain the traffic safety concerns to me. I live them, so do many of the speakers that we heard from. There's no better time than now to be doing this work. It is not going to get easier. It is absolutely not going to get any cheaper. Um, and so I will just say this is a major missed opportunity. I am I'm angry and heartbroken about it, not just for um, myself and my family, of course, but for the speakers we heard from, for the huge number of people who currently uh, live in and travel through this area, and the huge number who will call the Broadway corridor home or will come there for work, um, we are missing a significant opportunity to make it safer for them to move around, and uh, and I and I'm very disappointed about that. Okay, uh, Councillor Klassen. Thank you, Chair. Um, so first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, all the people who've been in, involved in this dialogue, uh, beginning with our staff, who clearly had to weigh some uh, very important options. Uh, those who've had taken the time to read this report will understand um, that we were faced with um, a lot of different choices. Um, there was a lot of things that people want to do with this particular uh, uh, land, but this roadway, um, this space. And um, what we have heard so far from staff is that um, at this juncture, uh, it makes it very difficult to make a choice where we um, uh, squeeze the actual um, uh, transportation aspects around this uh, roadway uh, for, for trucking, for shipping, for um, getting uh, east and west in this corridor. Um, I also want to thank all the people who come to speak. We had 42 speakers uh, on the list uh, yesterday. We heard from most of them, and most of them expressed very strong and passionate and I thought well-reasoned arguments um, uh, around why uh, they wanted to see more active transportation in this route. However, what we are planning to put forward here with option one is to create a great pedestrian experience, a great people experience. This will not be a crappy street. This is going to be a street that people actually want to go to. Um, so I think we have to take into a factor that um, this, um, uh, the way, from, from one side of the road to the other, we have the opportunity to widen the sidewalks. We have the opportunity to plant trees. We've heard about uh, the deficit of trees and the deficit of tree canopy, the important aspects around the climate that that pr uh, provides. We also want to give people more space to, to, to live and recreate and be a part of these communities. Right now, Broadway is not an attractive street. It will be a more attractive street um, if we, if we go, follow this plan. It also leaves open the door for the adaptation of these, uh, these routes, if we desire, in, in the future, as we've done with several major streets in this city over the last 15 years. So I think we need to really take a look at what the option is before us. We also, just minding my time here, um, we also have to recognize that, that, um, that we have uh, a number of arguments have been put forward, particularly around safety. We have a calmed, um, uh, 
uh, route that goes east-west for the most of this corridor, which staff in our, in, in our questions to them uh, have explained will receive its own enhancements. So we have a lot of other routes in the city, including the ones that run parallel to this uh, corridor, that we're going to have um, additional uh, work done to them as well. So I think that if we were um, concerned about the safety piece, I think we see that work is, is already underway and then there's more work to be to happen in the future. Um, I, I just think that um, uh, we are um, in, a, in a, a challenging situation given the fact that the, there is no budget set aside for this project right now. And so for us to start spending money that we know that will be taken away from other routes and other parts of public infrastructure that need to be, uh, need to be worked on and are in the, in the planning stages uh, would be irresponsible. I do trust our staff. Our staff are uh, known as global leaders at creating active transportation. Look what we've done in our city. We are looked at as a model for this. Um, and our staff are coming back to us saying, let's hold off on this one around. Let's do option one. Let's widen the, 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 the sidewalks. Let's create a great experience on the street for pedestrians, for people, and look at the, our options as we move forward. I don't think this is a zero sum game. I think this is an opportunity to create a great street and make it very, uh, even better. So um, I'm going to uh, be voting against um, or voting for the amend amendment here and supporting option A that was brought forward by our city staff. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I'd like to add some of my comments. Uh, I also would like to thank all of the speakers who came in person and were on the line uh, late into yesterday evening uh, to share their perspectives and, and very much valued and appreciated some of the expertise. I also want to thank our staff uh, because it was the last council that gave direction to staff to examine the feasibility uh, of this infrastructure on Broadway and they've reported back with their expert advice that Councillor Klassen referred to. Um, I want to note as I start my comments is that um, we have gotten into very binary conversations at times in this city and it's, it's unfortunate because in fact uh, when I look around the room here of my council colleagues is uh, many of us are indeed cyclists ourselves and are raising children to be cyclists and, and to active transportation and are in fact as I've said before multimodal and some of us use vehicles at times sometimes we're using uh, public transit. I was on public transit today uh, and sometimes we're cycling and so we need all different modes, uh, but just acknowledging that so we don't get stuck in that binary. Uh, I want to acknowledge one piece that I think is really important in the staff recommendation is that it actually is in fact future-proofing uh, this street and that that was really clear and so it's saying not never it's just not now and in fact that as Councilor Klausen was acknowledging is that there is an opportunity to adapt and in fact what we need to do first is get that Broadway subway line in place uh, and I did inquire with staff the other day about um, public transit um, on an ongoing basis so in addition to the subway line we will have local serving buses returning uh, we know that uh, transit ridership is also increasing and going up again post-pandemic. And we also have uh, a significant uh, corridor, which is part of the major road network, that has to be there to move goods and services, as well as serve as a, a response route for first responders, as well as to uh, the hospital, which is a big part of that area, is VGH. Um, I also want to speak to the fact that this can be done incrementally, but we also need to be thinking about the enormous demands on our capital plan. Um, and members have spoken to the costs of doing business and adding infrastructure now versus doing it later. We uh, have a number of capital infrastructure needs, uh, particularly around active transportation. And if you look at the city, there's actually a deficit. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure in the north part of the city and a deficit of inf cycling infrastructure and active transportation in the south part of the city. And you have examples like Kent Avenue uh, in the south, uh, areas around Kingsway, uh, and um, also in the east around Portside, where you have significant gaps in that infrastructure. And so we're going to have to make choices, and they're difficult choices. Um, but right now, as staff have noted in our report, is there is no funding for this, but we do need to look at a four-year capital plan, and I think that we need to be looking at some of those other areas that are underserved for this infrastructure, and I hear regularly from residents in the south of Vancouver, from east Vancouver, about that infrastructure. Uh, and, and finally, um, I just want to speak to the fact that um, 
This area is changing, and, and yesterday we made some bold moves around housing uh, with uh, moving away from a pace of change policy. We have a significant transit investment coming forward. We have adjacent uh, cycling routes and infrastructure that is going to be upgraded uh, in, in the years to come. And um, again, I have confidence in uh, what's been delivered here by staff because there are opportunities to adapt once we have uh, the subway line in in three years. And so for those reasons, I will be supporting the staff recommendation that's been moved. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Klaas, I'm going to cede the chair to you for a moment. Um, I want to thank staff for their well-thought-out uh, report on the possibility of active transportation lanes on Broadway. Uh, I know we peppered you with questions yesterday from nearly every angle, uh, and I feel really confident um, with the recommendation that you've made uh, for option one. And I'd also like to thank all the speakers uh, who were so passionate that spoke to us yesterday. Um, I understand their passion for cycling, and it's one of the great, thing, uh, great things about living in Vancouver. We have amazing cycling infrastructure. Um, and we're building more. So uh, for me, this isn't a, a binary choice, uh, as uh, some of the other councillors have mentioned. Not voting for the bike lanes on Broadway doesn't mean that we don't support cycling infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to continue to push for investment into routes like the Portside Greenway, which has significant gaps uh, when there aren't any alternatives nearby, or Kent Avenue, as Councillor Dominato mentioned, in South Vancouver, which I've written on, which has you know massive trucks coming within inches of cyclists. Uh, in my mind, those routes should be prioritized as uh, there is no budget set aside for this project, unfortunately, to add uh, the possibility of adding lanes to Broadway. Uh, and given that the planning work uh, has already gone into the station blocks on Broadway, as we've heard, and there is uh, potentially a significant, significant cost of making changes uh, to those plans at the last minute, um, option one recommended by staff still keeps the door open, as councillors have mentioned, to adding lanes in the future. And I feel confident about that uh, future possibility. And as well, there are the two parallel lanes uh, to this uh, route on Broadway, which are less busy, um, where cyclists can take the whole lane and not be riding alongside traffic on a major arterial street. Uh, and as someone who used to bike to work every summer at UBC from downtown, I personally never felt a need for a dedicated route on Broadway. And I actually really appreciated 10th Avenue because it's slower and more residential. So I'm looking forward to some of the other uh, big cycling infrastructure uh, investments that we're making, including Granville Street Connector or Granville Bridge Connector uh, opening soon and construction getting underway on that. And uh, I will be supporting the staff's uh, recommendation for option one. And uh, Councillor Klassen, I'll take the chair back. Councillor Carr. Yeah, um, well, to say that um, I'm disappointed is an understatement. Uh, I think we are. I mean, if I'm hearing my um, colleagues around the council table, ABC colleagues around the council table uh, state their opinions on this, um, I am distraught around the fact that it is actually putting Vancouver, slowing down Vancouver in acting on climate change, in acting around public safety, um, in, in acting on, um, on a vision for Vancouver, which has us amongst um, the cities that are really tackling these issues uh, in the most progressive and bold ways. And we need progressive, bold action in order to really um, uh, tackle the climate crisis and ensure that we have a healthy future for our children. Um, I'm hearing arguments um, around safety, for example. It's not, we know, we've heard, safety is the best with AAA bike lanes, uh, for e-scooters, for cyclists. We've heard people tell us that there are many accidents that occur and near accidents on the 10th Avenue adjacent bike route, which is not real, it's certainly not a AAA bike route. It is a bike path, um, but it's got its limitations. It's not a solution. Um, Fiscal responsibility, we've, um, I, I just, I can't believe anybody in this room is gonna, th is thinking it's going to be cheaper to do this later than now. Everything gets more expensive. Now when the street is torn up is the time that we need to move forward on this uh, AAA bike lane and, this, and that safe infrastructure. Um, it's really important. It's really important that uh, we 
we think not only of what is important for the street of Broadway to make it a world-class street. And if you've visited any European streets, you see them. I mean, the ones that in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, many of the German streets and the Scandinavian cities, you know, they have built that cycling infrastructure into their cities and more people end up using um, bikes as a consequence because it is safe, because the infrastructure is there. I think of the youth that spoke to us too. And we know the staff most youth are now not considering buying a car. They want alternative transportation. They need the cycling infrastructure that makes sure that their use of um, uh, active transportation is as safe as possible. So um, I am really very, very disappointed because I... You know, I love the fact that Vancouver has been aiming to be one of the world leaders on climate action, and you're rolling it back if you vote for, um, for the, the uh, uh, first option as opposed to be. You're rolling back our leadership. Hey, thanks, Councillor. Councillor Joe. Yes, thanks, Chair. So I think I expressed my opinion earlier, so I won't repeat, but I want to emphasize that um, again. Most people want walkability on Broadway. You know, more than 60% of people ranking the uh, walking experience as the top priority. When people see the patios, trees, street furniture, green spaces, wider pedestrian walkway, and more people, will, more people will take advantage of the public transit and enjoy walking on Broadway with their family. This will be the best street and continue to be better and better as we collect more information and evaluate and then make decision. So I think that's exactly what option one will deliver. So I really believe this is a really professional team. I trust their knowledge and the judgment. There are so many examples that uh, wrong decision because of the uh, non-professional people give direction to professional people. We need to learn from those mistakes. So again, so the cost of this mistake will be huge if we, ha we have to undo this, um, this construction in the future. So uh, as I mentioned I, in my previous speech, I think uh, it is not about making bold decision, it is about making the right decision. When timing, when more data, more information, and more funding are available. Uh, yeah, I will leave it here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sim. Thank you very much. Uh, so I also want to thank all of the team members for all the incredible work that they put in um, to give us a full picture of what our options are. And I want to thank all the speakers that did come and um, take a lot of time out of their day and their lives to come and speak on a very uh, passionate issue. Uh, uh, full disclosure, uh, every single person in my family, uh, we are avid cyclists. We love to mountain bike ride. We like to road ride. And we've been traversing this city um, actually since I was uh, in grade four, I used to ride my BMX, my mongoose BMX uh, from, you know, uh, the 2800 block of East 54th all the way down to uh, 240 West 62nd in the time you can actually do that. Um, so needless to say, I am very pro bike infrastructure. I am pro multimodal infrastructure. And in a perfect world with unlimited resources, we would literally do everything. Unfortunately, uh, we do not live in um, La La Land where we have unlimited resources. And so we do have to prioritize. Um, like I said, we have limited resources and we have a greater need for infrastructure uh, in many parts of Vancouver that is under service. The Broadway corridor is one of the most well-served uh, corridors in the city. We have a full bike lane on 10th Avenue with additional routes on 7th, 8th and 14th. And uh, using limited funds in these uh, uh, to build new, un, uh, you know, not totally necessary lanes on Broadway would impact our ability to improve active transportation corridors, uh, including uh, Portside Greenway, Kent Avenue, Eastside uh, Crosscut, Robson um, Pedestrian Improvements, and Granville Street. Now, what we're really talking about here is answering the question of whether it's a good idea to spend 10 to $20 million to build another bike lane when there's already full, excellent infrastructure literally one block away. Um, it's about prioritizing. And so 
Um, I do agree with um, uh, Councillor Carr. Um, we need to address climate change. And I agree with her uh, that safety, if, if we have infrastructure that people will use, especially with biking, um, and it's safe, more people will come out. And it will actually uh, change behaviors so we can address climate change even more. And that's why I support the amendment and option A, because we can take those limited resources and instead of investing them in an area that already has a lot of infrastructure, we can go to other parts of the city to build this type of infrastructure to get people on their bikes to make it safer and to change behaviors. And so... Um, like I said, I'm going to be voting for the amendment and option A to um, address those issues, uh, the, the shared uh, goals that uh, Councillor Carr has, has just mentioned. So, thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. And forgive me, folks, for popping in and out there. I had a couple things on the go. Uh, I won't be supporting this amendment. Uh, uh, I do want to acknowledge and appreciate the work that staff have put into uh, all these options and considerations and, and indeed sitting through the multiple speakers. Um, and I appreciate the irony of me speaking against the staff recommendations here and their professional expertise. Uh, just yesterday I was speaking in favor of uh, staff's professionalism and expertise in defending their recommendations for a piece of change report. Yet here we are. So. <clears throat> uh, I do appreciate the, 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 the expert engineering opinion. And I want to just reflect that, that you know, uh, I do also share a, a vision for Broadway as a great street. I think uh, that'd be fantastic. But a great street is a street that uh, welcomes all users and has active transportation. Um, you know, uh, Paul Storer, who brings a lot of expertise to this, uh, described the other day that Broadway isn't a commuter through fare, really. It's a it's destination street. And when we talk about this great street on Broadway, we're talking about making a better destination. We're talking about patios and trees and more generous sidewalks and stuff. And we need to recognize that people are going to really need to get there. And I was really impressed with the first speaker we had yesterday who talked about the grade. And I, you know, I really never thought about the grade issue so much. I cycle here almost every, every day. Uh, and I really appreciate cycling away from here because it's all downhill. And well, that's fantastic. But, but, but the reality is it is that last little bit's a, a bit of a hump. And when we're asking people to ride along 8th and use that as the, as the bike route, and then ride up the hill to go to their destination on Broadway, and then ride back down the hill, and then ride back up the hill. That's bonkers. Nobody wants to do that. If we want to make a street that is actually a great street and a destination street, we need to have that sort of built-in infrastructure that can support all users, all forms of mobility. And you know, and what this amendment really says, and what the the the, the, the overall approach is, that bikes aren't welcome. That active transportation is not going to be welcome on on Broadway because the reality is is that if you want to participate in this great street, if you want to access all those things, and you don't want to have to go up and down the hill, you're going to have to ride in the road. And if anybody's ridden an actual, ridden a bicycle on Broadway, that's horrible. That's scary. You got buses coming up behind you. you it's, it's not a great place to ride a bicycle, and I've done it. Um, the time to do this is now. We've got the streets ripped up. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic on Broadway that we've normally seen. And this comes back to that whole notion that I brought up a few times about induced demand. If we build the active transportation lane, people will come. If we build more car lanes, more cars will come. This is the time where we make these kind of visionary decisions to really define what a great street's going to look like. Uh, it's not going to be any cheaper. It's not going to be more practical to revisit this later. In fact, there'll be more encumbrance because nobody's going to want to rip up Broadway again. I guarantee you that. And uh, we'll never see this happen. And, you know, we really, we can have it all. We can have the trees. We can have the patio. We can have the sidewalks. And we can have the separated active transportation lanes. And I just, you know, want to reflect that, that when we, when I was first elected in 2018, uh, you know, the whole idea of, of people zipping around the city on electro scooters was not a thing. And, and actually, thanks, credit to the work of, you know, ABC Councillor Sarah Kirby Young, who really pushed hard to see those micromobility scooters piloted in our city and, like, to, to embrace this opportunity with the provincial government to, like, pilot micromobility in the city of Vancouver and electromobility. I, I, I think it's, it's ludicrous to assume that we can have a safe, welcoming, great street with people on scooters zipping down the sidewalk. It's not going to happen. It's not a safe street. It doesn't become a pedestrian-friendly street. It actually becomes like more of, a, 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 of an awkward street to navigate. And we know that if we're going to talk about patios and restaurants, we're going to have food delivery guys. This is an opportunity to really think 
forward, think future, and, and do it right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to support this amendment. I really wish there was more of an opportunity to have more of a conversation around how we could land something on option two, because I think that is the best way to go. And I will leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Um, okay, seeing no one else on the queue to speak to the amendment, I'm now going to call the vote. Uh, Clerk, if you could please move us to the voting panel, and Council, if you could please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, in opposition, Councillor Carr, Councillor Boyle, and Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young and Councillor Bly, both absent. We'll now go to the uh, main motion or the main queue. Um, the original mover, Councillor Montague, do you have anything further to add to the conversation? Uh, no, Chair, I, I don't think so. I think I'll just okay. leave it where we left it. Uh, Councillor Klassen. Uh, no, thanks uh, very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks. I, I just um, will be brief in saying there's been a, a lot of nice comments about active transportation, about climate action. Um, I, I am glad, I guess, to hear them, but none of it means anything until it hits the ground for people. Um, we are only six months into our term, but we have been missing opportunities to make it hit the ground for people. The, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out their last of six reports a week or two ago, and it was um, incredibly clear the urgency that we need to be uh, acting with, um, and, uh, and this decision could not be in more stark contrast with that urgency. Uh, so we have three and a half more years um, to make the kinds of changes that, that really future-proof our city for residents. We see these impacts every season to our infrastructure, to the health of the people around us, and particularly to the health of people who are already struggling the most, to seniors, to people with um, health conditions already. Uh, these are real impacts, um, and the decisions we make, like this decision, uh, have real impacts on people's health and safety, and all of the nice statements that we can make about climate, about theoretically supporting uh, these types of changes don't matter as much as the moments like this that we have where we, we decide whether it lands for people or not. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll just add some further final closing remarks in that regard is that we're not talking about theoretical application. This city is investing multi-millions of dollars in resilient infrastructure, climate adaptation and mitigation, um, investments around building retrofits, uh, EV charging stations. We are probably making the largest investment in all the municipalities in this province. I could be wrong. Somebody can fact check that. Um, but certainly that is not theoretical. It's incredibly tangible. And we have enormous deficits across the city and other areas of the city that deserve infrastructure, but we can't do it all at once. And so I think we just need to be clear and set the record straight that there is significant investments on being undertaken in, in the name of um, addressing climate change in the city. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dominato. Okay, seeing no one else on the queue, uh, I am now going to call the vote on the final motion as amended. Uh, Clerk, if you could please take us to the voting screen, and Council, if you could please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, the motion carries. Apologies, we're waiting for one more vote. Uh, do you need a vote assist, Mayor? In favor. Okay. Apologies, that was premature. Uh, the motion carries with Councillor Carr in opposition, Councillor Boyle in opposition, Councillor Fry in opposition, Councillor Kirby Young absent, and Councillor Bly absent. And that concludes item two on the agenda.
Okay. We had a request yesterday to um, hold item 12 or consider item 12, but um, uh, given Councilor Dominato no, no longer wishes to hold this item uh, for question and there's no presentation, may I have a motion to vary the agenda to accept report 12 before we continue with the next item? Okay, Councilor Montague, all those in favor say yay. Any opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. Okay, we will now move on uh, to item two, um, or pardon me, seven. The seventh item on the agenda is 67 West 6th Avenue, Turntable Hospitality Corporation, Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, dual license, liquor primary license application, liquor establishment class two. Does any member wish to declare, declare a conflict of interest on this item? We have team members here from development, building, and licensing to present the item, and I'd like to invite them to the podium to introduce themselves. Afternoon. Council, uh, my name is Sarah Hicks. I'm the Chief License Inspector. Uh, we don't have a presentation on the report today, but uh, we do have uh, staff as well as the applicant available for questions. Okay, great. Uh, so, Council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of team members. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Montague. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I was reading through the report and also uh, some email correspondence that I got regarding some of the concerns from area residents about uh, a change in the license. Um, and one of the things that came up from a couple of people was um, disturbances in the neighborhood late at night. And I noticed that there was uh, some uh, potential mitigating efforts being made on behalf of the business owners, but I'm just wondering if we could expand on that and specifically as to whether or not there was uh, previously this business had uh, door staff and uh, how that is going to work in the future. Sure. I wonder if that question may be best of the, of the business. Is, is Cameron online? Do you know Bert? He's out here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find it. He was downstairs earlier. We'll see if I can find him. Meanwhile, I'll carry on. Maybe we can... Stop my timer, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> you <time> <clears throat> sure.
My question, if I could maybe start my, my survey from scratch, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, so my question is basically, um, we've heard some complaints about uh, noise in the neighborhood, disturbances in the neighborhood as a result of patrons leaving the business. Um, and I see in the report that there's some uh, things that you're planning on doing to mitigate some of that. But I specifically wanted to know about, uh, it sounds like you're introducing a, uh, someone at the door and uh, whether you have that now and what other uh, plans you have in place to mitigate noise late at night um, and as people leave the establishment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is fine. You can hear me. This is my first time here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I come from a feedback-driven background, so I worked for Earl's Restaurants on their executive team the last 10 years, uh, and feedback is something that I, I value uh, a ton. Uh, so the information session six weeks ago when I had a chance to sit down with the neighbors and, and collect all their feedback was gold. There were so many things that they brought up that I could do better in my business that we're already implementing. Um, so far, everything that we work together on, I have a list and I'm crushing everything. Uh, so one of the noise complaints was an audio barrier. Uh, so in the front, we just have some hedges that were planted. Uh, we have a quote, the trees are going to be in early April, and we have 12-foot hedges going all the way across the front, which is going to, to seal that up. Uh, the other thing that we've done is we removed the speakers off the front patio. Um, this was an oversight. This is my first restaurant. I didn't know. I see every restaurant in Yaletown has speakers. Just I was, I was new to it. Uh, so we took those off immediately, which was, which was an easy one. Um, a camera and security monitoring. So something I did was take one of our cameras and move it in a better position outside so now we can see the front of our restaurant. So now when we collaborate with the neighbors, we have a better idea of what's going on all the time. Um, and then the big ones. So we'll see when I go into my presentation a bit later that we have put up a bunch of signage and started creating a different flow within the restaurant itself. So over the last six weeks, identifying the, um, the, the idea for doorman and security but one, security is very expensive, and right now we're not profitable. And security uh, has to have insurance and is a few hundred dollars a night. Um, so I personally have been the doorman for the last six weeks on Friday, Saturday nights for every weekend, but one that was my, my brother's 40th. So I've been out there from uh, 9 p.m. until midnight reading a book on the front porch every Friday and Saturday acting in this position. Um, in that time, I learned a lot. I learned that some of our guests uh, are rowdy when they walk out, and it's pretty easy to, uh, to mitigate. Um, but more concerning is just that our, our guests are having a good time, there are speakers inside, and when they walk outside, it's loud immediately, even if they're waiting for an Uber. So it's not just our, our, our guests that may, may um, be causing a bit of trouble, it's all the time we have people that are just loud, and those houses, they can hear everything. So what we're doing right now is we have created new signage. I'll show you in the presentation that we have an exit sign that says, please respect our neighbors with a big shush. When you walk outside, there's a massive smoking sign that directs people down the block where we put up a, an ashtray away from the neighbors. Um, and a third sign that's outside continually to direct them in the right way. And that's something so, that hasn't been going on uh, up until just recently? like the signage and, and you as The signage has been up for four or five weeks. The ashtray went in three weeks ago when it came in from Uline. So over the last six weeks, we jumped on everything immediately. And as it's arrived and we designed the signs, we had them printed, we put them up as quick as we, we possibly could. So the signage is super cool. I'll show it to you when we go through it. Um, doorman is what the job I'm doing right now. We've already posted the position. It's been posted for three weeks. We have two applicants we're interested in with the goal of bringing somebody on for the week of April 8th. Um, Hi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we yeah. just realized something procedurally that uh, you're on the speaker's list, I believe, correct? Yes. So actually the questions to you directly, they need to be during the speaker's section. So hey, I was planning on covering this anyways. Yeah, so. No, it's just a procedural thing. So we'll come back to you and then uh, the counselors will be able to ask you questions directly. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get my good one in yet. You'll still have time. <laughs> Okay. Apologies about that. Thanks, clerk, for uh, pointing clerks for pointing that out. Um, okay. Uh, any more questions for staff uh, from council? Uh, not seeing any. Uh, so we will now hear from the registered speakers for this item. Uh, first speaker is uh, Berend Shun. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, in person, I think that's him there. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, is it Berend? Brent. Berend, but okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, Thank Brent, you. you have up to five minutes. Please go okay. ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Sim and councillors for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Brent Scone. I'm a resident of the zero to 100 block of West 6th Avenue. I've lived in my home for 20 years. Um, I'm a part of a much larger group of residents, households and business owners in the immediate vicinity of Mount Pleasant Vintage Provisions. Uh, I join all other residents whose homes are on this block on West 6 in opposition to this application. Before I share, for, share my reasons for opposing this, I would first like to confirm that Mayor and Council received a link to a short video montage uh, titled MPVP Footage Compilation for City Council. Has everyone had a chance to view that? Okay. Uh, it's quite integral to our case about things going on. Uh, if you've not seen the video, um, I'd like you to have a look. Um, so it's a clip that shows the behavior of large crowds of MPVP patrons as they leave the establishment, screaming, yelling, throwing light bulbs, pylons, and other projectiles, sometimes well in the evening hours, as well as the way that the acoustic design of the building directs and amplifies sound to adjacent residents. Of the various clips which range from last September up until just last week, the most alarming video was this incident involving approximately six Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions patrons at 12.30 a.m. in the morning February 18th, six weeks ago which lasted approximately 20 minutes. All, all neighbors discussed being awoken by this. Two people called the police. It is also very important to note that this incident happened after a meeting with residents hosted by the consultancy firm Rising Tides, during which representatives of the business promised impacted residents that they would work to address concerns around noise, security, safety, and large crowds. Uh, promises that you will see in the video have not been met. Uh, Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions was open during this time of this incident and sadly MPVP staff were present on the premises and watched the scene without intervening or calling the police. Uh, putting the public safety responsibility on the residents. The scene did not dissipate until residents of the block called the police and officers dispersed the crowd at no doubt significant cost to the city and police resources. Uh, I would also like to point out that the council report before you is inaccurate in relation to community impact as is it not reflective of existing city data regarding noise complaints and numerous residents calls to the police non-emergency line and 911 regarding this business. Uh, city staff were notified about this missing data. They insist the report could not be amended to include this data in time. Um, Council, what I believe this video shows, as do the numerous similar experiences reported by residents to both the police and the city, is that MPVP is not currently living up to the responsibilities and guidelines of their current liquor license to manage the large intoxicated crowds from their establishment that they entertain. And as such, they should not be considered for this extra license. Uh, what I'd like to add most importantly is that a liquor primary on our quiet street is just a bad fit. The owner of MPVP knows this business. The idea of a liquor primary license directly across from a quiet row of households on an otherwise quiet side street away from downtown should have been obvious from the start to be a plan that is pitted against the existing households on our street. It has been a shock to all of us what has developed here and we all have taken a day off work yesterday and as well today to be here in the hopes that a just decision is made to reject the application for an extended liquor license. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for coming in to speak today. Thank you. Uh, apologies for the delay yesterday. We had a lot of speakers. On oh, it's a busy day, it looks like. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we'll, uh, we actually have questions uh, okay. before you leave the podium from Councillor Fry. Please go ahead. Sure. And uh, uh, Hi. And I don't I know think. how many more folks have signed up to speak for Oh, you, I but... think there might be 10 or 11. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Um, so we did hear from the applicant that, that in the last six weeks, they've met with you and worked to improve the, uh, some of the issues. And certainly I saw the video with the pylon throwing right. competition and stuff. Have, have you seen improvement in the last six weeks? Not that we noticed. No, I didn't. That's all a bit news to us. It's encouraging to hear a, a hedge getting planted. That sounds good. Uh, but you, you did meet with the applicant and there was uh, we had a meeting yeah six weeks well that was more than six weeks ago that was 
When was that meeting? Early January? Okay, six weeks ago. Right. This incident happened after that. Um, Darren, our neighbor, went over to visit with, uh, to check out the situation after that event and knocked on the door. Nobody responded to him. They didn't seem to be getting out and getting involved with clearing up the melee, so. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I, I guess that was it. I just wanted to get the sort of yeah. clarification there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming in. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now go to speaker number two, uh, Susan here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, so you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Uh, my name is Susan, and I've been a resident of the 0 to 100 block uh, West 6th Avenue, Vancouver, for 31 years. Um, I'm here today to ask uh, Mayor Sim and uh, all of our city councillors to please consider and support my total opposition to the new dual liquor primary license application for the business located at 67 West 6th Avenue, Vancouver. Not being familiar with process protocol, it was with great dismay I was made aware only uh, now seven days ago prior to this meeting that the collective expressed concerns and multiple complaints submitted to the city, non-emergency and 911 police made by myself, fellow residents, and the owners of a commercial business on our block are not accurately included, nor are our voices inclusively represented in the report before you today. I therefore request that you become familiar with them through further comprehensive investigation and some examples of the disruptions and disturbances to our quality of life, enjoyment of our homes, comfort, health, and sometimes safety on our street as a direct result of invasive and loud noise, egregious and negative behaviors generated by the business and a number of their patrons. Since the business opened, we've experienced unreasonable amounts of disruptive noise levels, affecting our ability to comfortably enjoy the use of our homes, interrupting and preventing sleep, repeated incidents of discarded litter around our vehicles and front lawns. We have been subjected to inebriate patrons yelling obscenities and communicating with raised voices, hooting, whistling, uh, screaming and hollering. There have been instances of trespassing, including urinating on our lawns, people sitting on our front steps without moving to let me pass. I have on a few occasions felt unsafe to exit my vehicle upon arriving home at night when parking in front of my address in our permit parking zone. Being afraid to exit my vehicle due to a loitering group of men who appear to be drunk disorderly is not something I had ever experienced prior to this business operating on our block. It is in light of the invasive nature, ongoing and continuous um, disturbances that I am opposed to an increase in time and capacity to what is for us an already untenable situation. When incidents escalate, we have had to get up out of bed to look, see and determine if anyone is in need of immediate help. Then we often have to wait on hold for long periods of time while placing a call to the non-emergency police, if indeed you can successfully get through, especially on weekends. Um, we then have to, as suggested by the police, in order to have our concerns recognized, make a complaint and include the record of the non-emergency police complaint in our record of a complaint to the city. It seems in my view and understanding that the Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions is already unable to meet some of the terms and conditions of its current license with regard to good neighbor and business practices and the ability to meet some of the requirements of their responsibilities. For example, the business and their employees are responsible for controlling the behavior of patrons and they are required to take steps to ensure their business does not disturb the surrounding community. In the broader sense of my understanding, no person shall make or cause any noise or sound in the street or similar public place which disturbs or tends to disturb unreasonably the quiet, peace, rest, enjoyment, comfort or convenience of persons in the neighborhood or vicinity. The prevalent negative impact of this level of disruptive noise and disturbance this business currently exposes us to has eroded the quality of our lives causing duress and distress in a manner that we should not have to endure on the street where we live. I believe any extension of hours or increased capacity would exacerbate our very challenging, difficult, and problematic situation in our immediate vicinity and community. I would like to take this opportunity to point out that we have several food and liquor licensed locations in our neighborhood and surrounding environment that we support and enjoy and that operate without causing disruptive disturbances and noise complaints. I urge you to please consider our current circumstances and reject this application for 67 West 6th Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, uh, we'll move to, <clears throat> excuse me, speaker three, uh, Darren Fleet. Uh, do we have Darren here? On the phone, potentially. Hello? Hi, Darren. Hello? 
Hi, Hi Aaron. can you hear yep, me? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. So you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, Council and Mayor, and thank you for taking the time uh, to hear us today out of a very busy uh, couple of days for all of you. Uh, my name is Dr. Darren Fleet. I'm a university professor here in the city of Vancouver, uh, and I live across the street uh, right from from the front door of Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. Uh, and I have uh, three children, ages nine, six, and seven months old. Uh, and I've lived in my home for 14 years. And actually two of those children were born in our home. I oppose this motion. Um, I've spoken to the business owner operator on many occasions, uh, and I believe them to be a kind person. And, and I want it to be known that my opposition to this license is in no way personal, um, but rather due to the significant documented in good faith concerns about security, safety, uh, noise, and the behaviors of large crowds as they exit the business, often carrying on the inside party outside. Um, as many of you hopefully now have seen by the montage prepared for you today of residents' experiences, which of course is only a snapshot of what we have experienced, it is often the impacted community and not the applicant that has been forced to bear the brunt of the negative and disruptive behavior of some of their patrons, including of course that 15 to 20 minute projectile fight in the middle of our street on February 18th at 12.30 a.m. six weeks ago, um, which again, I have to stress if you can believe it, involved light bulbs, pylons, glass bottles and other projectiles uh, that were thrown both at people and at other businesses. Um, and that particular incident, of course, as one of our speakers has already said, only ended when I called 911 uh, and police broke it up. I'm not at all against the applicant uh, having a successful business, of course, and bringing in a new and welcome flavor and character to the neighborhood. In fact, there are, are already numerous successful businesses on our block and surrounding areas who offer important and unique services. Uh, and just like these other businesses, I believe the success of the applicant here today ought to be complementary to the residents who live here as opposed to in many cases that we have experienced at our expense. I also want to note that there are three other licensed establishments that are of approximate distance to the impacted residences closest to the applicant, some with seating of up to 140. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, of the experience of the impacted community, there have been no issues with these establishments uh, relating to noise or aggressive crowds and no calls to the police. Extend out even one more block and then there are three microbreweries and the Anza Club. Again, to my knowledge, there have been no issues for the impacted community represented here. Uh, and then of course, there's all of Main Street. Um, despite what you may read in the application before you, there is no shortage of places to drink in our neighborhood. Um, what, what I suggest is that what the business license proposal before you today here does, if approved, is lock in a relationship of permanent conflict where the impacted community has one sense, set of interests, which is public safety, security, reasonable levels of noise akin to other established businesses, and the interests of a single business, which is Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision, which, if I understand the license correctly, would transform into a nearly 200-seat liquor primary service with closing hours as late as 2 a.m. on some evenings. I see no future scenario in which the current pattern of noise complaints, police calls, and calls to 911 even do not continue to persist, but in fact drastically increase at no doubt great cost to the city uh, and policing resources if this application is approved. I am aware uh, that many members of this council have expressed commitments to public safety in the city of Vancouver. And so I ask you that you please take the significant public safety concerns uh, in addition to noise brought forth here today into consideration when you make your decision. Uh, and also, again, please keep in mind that the most serious incident to date, which is a 911 emergency call, uh, happened after a public consultation with the business where various commitments about noise, public security, and public safety were made. Um, lastly, and this is more of a personal note, um, I ask council members and mayor, um, having seen a glimpse of what we are facing, imagine this was your community. Imagine this was your home. Imagine it is your family who has to be on edge every evening until well past midnight, your three children asleep, waiting again for when it is you will have to call the police or maybe step outside at somewhat great personal risk to deal with a 20 or 30 or 40 person or even larger aggressive bar crowd uh, gathered in the street in front of you. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much for calling in, Darren. Uh, we'll now go to speaker number four. Uh, Leilan May Yin Wong. Um, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hi, good afternoon. 
afternoon. Um, hi, Council. My name is Leland Wong. I was born and raised in Mount Pleasant, and I first moved to Sixth Avenue in 2017. Um, I'd like today to discuss noise and safety as it relates to Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions and the block that I call home. So during the February 8th meeting hosted by the establishment and Rising Tide Consultants, which has been discussed a little bit today, 14 residents of the block shared our concerns about safety and disruption. Despite us testifying to the negative impacts it has had on our lives, Rising Tide Consultants repeatedly responded by asking us, but where do you go out? They wanted to hear which bars and restaurants we frequent to identify a gap in the sector. Well, I can tell you, I eat and drink at Tacofino, Faculty Brewery, Craft, and Elysian regularly. The question was in actuality moot because it overlooked what the conversation was about. It was about disruption to the comfort and safety of our homes and our well being, not about what businesses we enjoy. I felt very disrespected that day in being asked again and again about where we go out without consideration that what we were talking about was, where do we go home? Yesterday's council meeting largely centered around conversations of housing, and any discussion of home is about the livelihood of residents, about feeling secure and free of, free of aggravation in the space we make our best memories, where we come home after work to decompress, where we sleep at night after long days. Home is nothing if you don't feel safe. Since the bar opened only nine months ago, I've experienced anxiety about safety both inside and outside my home. I feel on edge sitting on my front porch as drunkenly loud patrons come and go, not only being unnecessarily boisterous or doing things like throwing pipe, um, the pylons, which Darren explained, but also, also often yelling up at me onto my porch. In the narrow passage beside my home, I found red solo cups and cigarette butts, evidence that intoxicated patrons are opening our gates, walking through our backyards um, all th in the middle of the night or late at night. Our block is made up of residential wood-framed homes, meaning my bedroom, is, uh, my bedroom window is on the main floor of the house, and I'm only feet away from these intoxicated partygoers. So because of this, I have felt nervous sleeping in my own home. And for me, it feels like I'm living directly on Main Street or the downtown Granville Strip. So my door is 105 feet steps away from Tacofino, 88 steps from La Fabrique St. George, the wine bar, and then 74 steps away from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. And despite the similar distances between these locations and my home, I have never once been disrupted by the noise of the other bars or their respective patrons, nor felt unsafe because of these patrons as well. The concerns outlined today are specific to Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. So prior to Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, I never felt there was a noise issue in our neighborhood. I felt the neighborhood was cohesively living and working together. Nine months ago, I was naive to the unimaginable changes the establishment would cause to our block's quality of life, and I fear deeply for the increase of such with the new license and the opening of the patio in the summer. Lastly, I'd like to highlight my concerns by discussing the limitations of acoustic measurements in protecting residents. Under the city's noise bylaw, acoustic measurements are the only method used to indicate noise level of an establishment. So this means that a singular one minute recording of noise coming from the establishment is used to represent the noise produ produced by the location at all times or its whole operation. The licensing office of the city is aware of this limitation. They explain so themselves to me over the phone, noting that if a, bar them, if a bar becomes aware that a measurement is taking place, they often turn down their music, close a door, or ask patrons to be quiet, and therefore many measurements are inaccurate and misleading. I draw attention to this limitation to highlight the responsibility of noise and safety control, that it has been taken away from the business and has been placed instead on residents and the police. Um, before me, Brent, Susan, and Darren demonstrated that we feel on edge every weekend, trying to protect our comfort and safety by resorting to calling the police. So the questions are, how can the city ethically hand out licenses if noise control bylaws are not protecting citizens? How can the licenses be granted when they knowingly lay responsibility on residents and the police, threatening not only our sense of home and safety, but also wasting police resources? Again, I love living in Mount Pleasant. I choose to live there. I'm supportive of businesses also wanting to be there. More importantly, however, and I think we'd all agree, I want to feel comfortable and safe in my home. And today I ask for you to support us in helping regain that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming to speak today. 
Um, seeing no questions, we'll go to speaker number five, uh, Rosa Balani. Uh, do we have Rose, Rosa on the phone? Hi, Rosa, is that you? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, Council. Thank you so much for hearing me today. Uh, my name is Rosa Balani, and I live at 14 West 6th Avenue in Vancouver, which is right across the street from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision. Um, I have lived in Mount Pleasant since 2009, and I've lived in this home for the last few years. And up until recently, I felt just incredibly lucky to have such a tight-knit community in a, in a community environment um, that really, it felt like home. And over the last seven months since Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions has opened, that feeling of home has been greatly changed. I know that uh, other community members are present in person today and have already spoken about the ongoing concerns that we have regarding community safety. I'm also sure that you're going to hear from many people today who talk about how this is a great place to go and eat and has a great environment, and I'm honestly not here to dispute that. I'm 25. I'm a student. I like to go and decompress and go out as much as anybody else does. Um, but the main issue here is the massive impact that Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions has had on the lives of people living on this block and the fact that these issues have been inadequately addressed over the last seven months of operation. As a community, we have tried our best over the last seven months to speak directly with the owner, with the City of Vancouver, with the police to mitigate these issues. However, as it has been described, these issues have continued until the present day. The environment of the block has changed drastically, and sitting on our front lawns in the evening often feels like we are now also on the patio of their bar. I feel really sad about these changes. The noise from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions is greatly in excess of a reasonable level that would be expected on a mixed residential and commercial street. And it's completely out of character from the many other restaurants, bars, and breweries that exist within even a four block radius of our home. The speaker before me mentioned some of these in particular. The noise can be heard from inside my bedroom until 1 or 2 a.m. currently. It doesn't take a lot of math to understand that this is going to extend even later into the night if the hours of the business are extended and if people are being served more alcohol with a liquor primary license. I also want to add that people are very drunk when, when they leave the bar, even with the current license. I know this because I see it from my bedroom window, which faces just over the entrance of Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision. I've seen people trying to push down the trees on the sidewalk. I've seen people just full-on tackling each other. I've seen people climbing the parking signs. I've watched people breaking bottles just for fun on the sidewalk. If this is what's happening with the current license, I'm worried what the state of things will become if there is a liquor primary license with extended hours. In conclusion, I'm speaking in opposition of the extension of the liquor primary license application for Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision, and I greatly appreciate your consideration today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, uh, we'll go to speaker number six, Prophecy Sun. Do we have Prophecy on the uh, phone? Yes, you do. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. So you have up to five minutes. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. It's so lovely to meet everybody, mayor and council, over the phone. My name is Dr. Prophecy Sun, and yes, that is my legal name. I'm an interdisciplinary artist, professor at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. My research practice is focused on immersive sound installations, video, and performance. I have written several book chapters and journal articles on these subjects and have also designed and exhibited multi-channel video sound installations regionally, locally, as well as internationally around the world. I'm also the mother. I'm also a resident of the 0 to 100 block of 6th Avenue, and I ask that you please toggle through the photographs that I presented uh, earlier, and I'm hoping that you can look at these as I'm speaking. I oppose the new dual liquor license application for the business located at 67 West 6th Avenue in Vancouver here. I oppose it for many reasons, but I would like to focus on two specific ones here. The first reason is inadequate sound baffling, which the business has not adequately addressed. The front of the restaurant and the patio facade are mainly made of concrete and wood, 
the exterior ceiling of the restaurant and the patio is constructed so that it, it's like a box and the music and the crowd noise and conversations bounce off all of the tall walls, the overhanging exterior ceiling and the attic and it, the inadequate structures that travel like an amphitheater directly towards my home and the other residences across the opposite side of the street. At present, you will see that in-council report that you have before you, the Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, indicates that they intend for music on the patio until 9 p.m. The business has not added or used any dampening techniques like what is used in a recording studio or a parking garage to mitigate this acoustic deficiency. The sound frequency is significantly amplified, and this is contrary to bylaws that stipulate that speakers must be within the building. Currently, the mix of sounds with patrons talking and yelling and music is not contained. This has been a significant change in the environment of our street. I live in an old wood house, and the noise transfer is very audible inside my home, even in my bedroom and where my children sleep. Even with the windows closed and the noisemaker on at full volume, during bedtime, the children are still awake. The level of sound makes it really hard to live in our space comfortably and also acquire and have a good bedtime. It feels like a concert hall. The business has planted a row of eight short bush bushes to create a barrier. This is not substantive enough to create any sound mitigation. I have repeatedly experienced that they are entirely inadequate to create a meaningful, muffled sound separation for the other residents and businesses on the block. When patrons are on the patio or outside, their voices carry and can, the sound can boom and move around like a car horn. Despite numerous requests to the city for a noise inspection from the location of the impacted properties in particular, the late evening hours have not been followed up. To my knowledge, over the last seven months, not a single inspector has come to measure the noise levels from the impacted community dwellings despite complaints every month. My second reason for um, opposing this application is about crowd management. The continual noise from the business, from the patrons inside as well as outside who are coming and going late at night, is very erratic, intermittent, and at times very continual. This has caused much disruption, as I was mentioning, in my home at bedtime and throughout the entire evening into the early hours of the morning. A major concern is that the business does not manage their patrons as they leave the building and also the vicinity. Often this, what happens is they stand outside and smoke near the premises and the disturbances continue. The significant increase in foot traffic, car traffic, and patron noise over the past um, seven months continues to disrupt my household and block and carries on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You do have questions uh, from Mayor Sim. Please go ahead. Um, no, I, I was just looking for the photos, actually, and then they're up here. And oh, okay. No worries. Okay. Uh, if, 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 may I follow up about that, about the photos themselves? Sure, um, if I can, uh, Mayor 30 Sim. seconds. Thank you. Mayor Sim, if you take a look at the structure of the building itself, there's a large um, facade that's all glass. That's not the issue. What the issue is the restaurant itself. The way that the sound is amplified, it's like I was mentioning, in a box. Everything, it, it just booms out from that one location, and it's the proximity of the ceiling, the height, the walls, and everything is concrete. There's nothing in any way to stop or dampen those sounds. And everything on the patio, including voices, does such. Thanks, it Dr. just makes Sun. it bigger am, and bigger. Thanks for calling in. I am going to have to, um, you're, you are a time, but Thank appreciate you. that additional context. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now go to, actually, sorry, Speaker 7 did withdraw. Uh, so we'll go to Speaker 8. Um, it says withdraw on my list. Uh, okay, I've got a old speakers list here, so we're just going to get an updated copy. Uh, okay, so Speaker 7 we do have. Uh, speaker 7 is uh, Kihan Yoon Henderson. Is that, uh, do we have uh, that person on the line? Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. So you have up okay. to five minutes. No Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, councillors and mayor, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Kihan Yoon Henderson, and I am a resident of the 0 to 100 block of West 6th Avenue. 
I live in one of the houses directly across from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, um, which you can see in the photos in front of you. And I oppose the dual license application by this establishment before you today. I don't have too much to add on, as we've heard from several of my neighbors directly already in detail about how Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions has been disruptive to our lives, causing anxiety and at times a feeling of a general lack of safety. The existing problems on our block would be exacerbated by the extension of hours allowed for in the license being applied for. I ask you to hear our concerns and take them into full consideration as you make this decision. Finding housing in this city is difficult. I heard that mentioned many times by councillors during the meeting yesterday. I find it ironic that as an establishment, Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions capitalizes on the charm of a Mount Pleasant street without respecting the basic needs, including comfort, security, and safety of the neighbors who live here. Families, working professionals, and students all committed to this neighborhood, to our city, and our community. It is unjust that the responsibility of safety has been placed onto residents. In my estimation, that's the responsibility of the city and the business. Unfortunately, thus far, it has been our responsibility to try and maintain decent conditions on our street to be able to sleep at night and feel safe. I feel concerned that we will be asked to continue to do this out of necessity later into the night if Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions receives this license. As you can see by the presence of many residents on the block who have taken the time to be here today, both over the phone and in person, this concern is very serious to us. I hope it is apparent to you all today that we're not resistant to change in our neighborhood. We celebrate new neighbors, both as business and residents. Instead, what we've been working uh, to protect ourselves against is conditions that do not respect the needs of neighborhoods with working people and families. For these reasons, and given the residential nature of the exact block that this business operates on, I ask you to deny the application by Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. You do have questions uh, from Councillor Dominato. Oh, no, we don't. Apologies about that. Thanks okay. for calling in. No worries. Appreciate Thank that. you very much. Okay, uh, we will go to speaker number eight, uh, Bert Hick. Good afternoon. Um, we we support the application. Uh, I, I support the application as presented to you, and I'd like to bring to your attention the provision in the policy in the in the report prepared by Sarah and her staff on page two, where staff recommends approval of this. Well, thanks. Um, the reason I'm for that is. There's two types of licenses in British Columbia, food primary, liquor primary. The city determined years ago that they would have control over liquor primary license establishments. The city will have far greater control over this establishment as a liquor primary license than it does now as a food primary. It'll be subject to a time-limited development permit. It'll be subject to acoustical report, a good neighbor agreement, and very regular inspections. Um, I very much support the dual licensing concept, and I think it's uh, a great way to assist the hospitality industry, and council last year did a great move by uh, adopting and allowing for dual license establishments. Cameron will speak to the specific issues that were brought up earlier, but I can tell you I'm close to this community because apart from coming to City Hall and hanging around the city council chambers, um, I also do part-time acting. And to the east of this building, you've got a substantial acting industry. You've got go, -to, go studios, you've got uh, acting places, you've got a casting workhouse, and we are always looking for places to go that are in this neighborhood, either to celebrate or commiserate, more commiseration than anything. And to me, this place is a welcome addition to the other places you have in this area. People don't want to have to cross bridges or move out of their neighborhood to enjoy good food and a quality establishment. And this, to me, is a good fit for this area. Matter of fact, in about 20 minutes from now, I might be looking for a place to go to have a sandwich. 
But um, I think that the fact that you'll have much greater control as a flicker primary speaks volumes. There will not be a capacity increase in this establishment because the footprint of the liquor primary establishment mirrors that of the food primary establishment. The, um, so I very much support this application and I, I support the recommendation of your staff. We did have a community meeting. We heard from the community from that and from that Cameron's made a lot of changes to make certain he is a good neighbor. And one thing he forgot to mention earlier when he spoke was the fact that he's given a cell phone number to all the neighbors so they can phone him directly if there's a concern or a problem. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bert. Um, we will now go to speaker number nine, uh, Nadine uh, McDowell. Uh, do we have Nadine? Oh, you're here in person. Hi. So you have up to five minutes, Nadine. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak with you today. I'm here to speak in full support of this application for a dual license for Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. I too am a resident of the area. No, I do not live across the street, but I am a mere three blocks away. I also grew up in the hospitality industry. This venue is not only unique in its offerings, because there is nothing quite like it in the area, but it is one of the most welcoming and warm hospitality venues around. The staff are friendly, knowledgeable, and the environment is such, in my experience, that I can go sit at the bar as a single female and feel very safe and very well taken care of. I have always left through the back entrance. I have always witnessed both Cameron and all of his staff being very vigilant in informing the patrons that they must leave quietly and respect the neighbors. They have established themselves as a community gathering place where everyone is welcome. I see business people after work, friends meeting up, kids running around the front area, and residents like me every time I go there. I know Cameron, the operator, and I can tell you without hesitation that this man is someone who has invested his blood, his sweat, and his tears just to make a community hub happen for Mount Pleasant. He cares so much about this community and wants to build something very special. I know that he has gone out of his way to be inclusive, accommodating, and cooperative with the residents of the area, despite what you may have heard today. He is a responsible businessman. He's just trying to earn a living and provide a venue that adds value to our community. And as a resident, I don't have to get in an Uber or get on a SkyTrain and go downtown or into Yaletown. I can invest in my own neighborhood, in my own backyard. On the heels of COVID, where the hospitality industry was hit so very hard, many small operators had to close their doors and say farewell to the only businesses they have ever known. I ask for your consideration of this license for this small operator who deserves a chance to keep his doors open. The profit margin you may not understand for restaurants is under 3%. Without a later business extension where sales can be increased, this operation will likely yet be another to close its doors. I, for one, think that would be a very, very shameful thing to happen. So I thank you very much for your time and your consideration. For coming in today. Thank you. Um, we will go to speaker number 10, Ian Tostenson. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, it's the bridge traffic in North Vancouver. But um, I just want to just say this: as our hospitality industry is, is as we know, is so important to to the fabric of British Columbia, and it showed res huge responsibility during the pandemic. I know that personally. I know we were able to move our industry on a dime when it came down to discipline, and and the reason for that is, and, and let's not forget this, we, in Cameron, he is in the hospitality business. It's the, it, in the, the definition of the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, and your premises at large in the neighborhoods that you occupy. So much of the industry now is centering on, um, and I think Nadine put it very well, where people want to stay closer to home, they're working at home, 
and they want to have places that represent their the values of their neighborhood and all the things that go with that. They don't necessarily want to get in the car and travel. They don't want to be going to places they don't know. And I, I really feel confident and, uh, you know, with how cameras approached this whole business that, you know, he, the last thing he wants to do is go underwater. And most restaurants are underwater. It's, it's a very difficult proposition right now coming out of COVID, even without COVID it was. But I can tell you what's going to drive Cameron to keep his doors open is to be a good neighbor. And, in fact, be an excellent neighbor, because without that support in general, and I know there's some opposition here, but in general, that's that's equally as important for him to be able to draw business into his establishment. It's also equally important for him to attract staff. And it's also equally important to have the flexibility and dual licensing in a labor-starved industry. We're short 30,000 people to allow some flexibility later in the evenings, although it's going to stay food-focused. Um, there'll be less emphasis and a little bit less pressure on, on the staffing side of it. So uh, what Bert said, I totally agree. There's, you know, the agreement to time limited to developments. There's the good neighbor agreements, and there's the acoustic reports. I think the city's got a lot of control. Um, but, you know, honestly, I, I don't think you're going to need to in, enact any of that stuff with Cameron. The heart and soul, he wants to make it a good business, and I fully support it on behalf of the industry of British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Appreciate the comments. Uh, we'll go to um, uh, Speaker Levin, Cameron Bogue, uh, here in person. Hello again. Welcome. Uh, do you guys have my deck that I sent over? We could just confirm that everybody has the deck. Do councillors have the deck? Okay, we're just going to get it up on the screen right now. You have now. a hard copy here, if interested. Okay, we're just going to get it up on the screen. Uh, so you can see it behind me here. Well, there's only, uh, only five slides, so I'll just prompt you as we go through them, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, so please go ahead. Cool. My name is Cameron Bogue. I am the owner-operator of Mount Pleasant Vintage, and I am for the approval of our dual license. Uh, I've been in hospitality for 25 years, in which time I've opened uh, 28 restaurants. Um, I've worked for some of the world's best operators around the world and, and just love the hospitality industry and want to offer some of this, uh, these trends to, to Vancouver. Um, in my 28 restaurants, I've opened restaurants for Daniel Balut in New York City, for uh, peer management in Las Vegas, and for the last 10 years, I was the, uh, on the executive team of Earl's Restaurants running their, their beverage program. So hospitality is, uh, is definitely in my blood. And when I was looking to open a restaurant, uh, I thought no further than Vancouver because the huge opportunities in this market. Um, Vancouver is a place that I wanted to come back to. My career started in Whistler. I was born in the Pacific Northwest, so coming back to Vancouver was huge for me. Uh, but more than that was the opportunities in the city. Um, Vancouver is a city that is way behind in culinary trends with our newest cocktail bars being about 12 years old. Uh, with a poorhouse diamond and kefir, I just know that what's going on in the world, there's a lot of opportunity for new trendy restaurants, and I believe that I'm, a, I'm the guy to do that. Uh, my goal ultimately is to provide a neighborhood bar and grill as a community gathering space and late night destination. Today I want to talk to you about three things. I want to address my neighbor's feedback, I want to show you the progressive steps that I've already taken, and share a little bit about my community. Um, starting with, uh, with, with feedback, we've, we've heard uh, the incident on tape um, and uh, everything that's uh, happened in the last six weeks since we've met. Um, my position at the bar has changed that I'm working the door uh, for the last six weeks on Friday, Saturday nights from 9 p.m. Till, till close to ensure that everything is happening smoothly. Um, even under my own eye, the one night in question, things still do go awry. Uh, I, I'm not perfect, and this is an extreme example of it. I worked the bar from the door from 9 till midnight. At midnight, I went in to do some managerial duties. The only last table were a group of eight people who were friends with an employee. Um, it was my poor assumption that they would behave and be good guests. They left 15 minutes after we closed, and we were uh, benign to the incident happening until, uh, until the next day. Um, again, I am very feedback prone, and I would love the feedback from my neighbors. They all have my cell phone numbers, but I have not received a single call in the last four months. Um, so I would appreciate your feedback and coming to me directly if these incidents occur. Um, regardless of this license, I will continue to improve. The onus is on me to be a good neighbor, which I am already addressing through my commitments. 
If we go to that second slide that you just started, these are the things that I've gone and addressed some of your issues from our last meeting. Uh, I, I can have my patio open to 11. I realize that it's loud. We're choosing to close our patio completely at 10 o'clock, which I think is better for families in the neighborhood. And we're closing our doors at 9, which limits all the music coming from the inside. Our speakers that are removed, in the top right, you can see we moved our CCTV camera to have a view of the street. Uh, and we have Rooted Wild BC, who quoted on hedges, which will be available in April at the 12-foot length. Uh, so this will all enclose that area and keep the sound inside of our patio. Uh, next slide, please. Um, inside, so here are the signs that I've added. Uh, the first top left, you can see directly out my front door, we put a giant smoking sign with an ashtray. Further in the distance on the street sign, there's another sign saying, please be good to our neighbors. And here you can see for context what our neighborhood is. Across the street, there's an illegal weed shop to the left. There's an illegal rave venue above that. There's an illegal porn studio next to it. And to the right, there's another illegal rave venue. Um, I'm not the only contributor to this neighborhood. I don't serve drinks in red solo cups. Um, there's a lot of other contributors to the, uh, the noise in this neighborhood. Um, the next slide is uh, commitments that I've made. So the door person. We are actively hiring security and a door person. We're hoping to have somebody on board for April 8th. Uh, I, as owner, have been acting in this role, um, but we're going to have them come on board and do this. Uh, during my time operating the front door, I've noticed that guests are loud, uh, and even our good guests come outside and waiting for an Uber, their voices are elevated, and even while they're nice, it's, it's really loud. And living in the in old houses, I'm sure you can hear everything. Uh, so one recommendation that they come up that I didn't think about was thinking of an alternative exit. Uh, this was one that I rushed really fast through our strata, and we have put these flyers on for the last, uh, the last month. So this is something that inside we have full exit signs. Every single one of our guests gets a, a, a flyer about our neighborhood, where we're, we care about our neighbors and are too often uh, our good times carry outside and keep them up at night. Please exit through the back after 10 p.m. And we have a recommended Uber pickup spot, a spot on Manitoba. So we're already doing this. Um, and at the same time, I'm out there checking decibels the entire time, which is very quiet unless a car drives by or one of our, our guests. Sorry, Cameron, you're out of time, but you got questions. So uh, we'll go to Councillor Montague. Shoot. Yeah, thanks. I, I think we'll just sort of continue where we left off earlier. Yeah, yeah, love it. Uh, and I think you answered most of my questions with regards to sort of what you're doing to mitigate some of the complaints and, and issues that are coming up. Um, it does seem like there's maybe a, just a little bit of a lack of communication between you and the neighbors at this point. And now, the business has been operating for how long? Six months. Okay. And how long ago did you start, if you could sort of go through one by one, when you started implementing all these? So when did the signs go in? This all happened in the last six weeks. So okay. as soon as we had the public information session, I had the list of items, and I started attacking everything immediately. So the signs were one of the first ones to go up. I designed those, got them up as quick as I could, reached out to security, had the cameras moved, and reached out to my arborist to quote on the hedges. That was done within the first day of leaving that meeting, and then everything else progressed as fast as I could get it done, design, print, and get everything up. And the alternate exit uh, from 10 p.m. onward out the back door, when did that get implemented? We've been trying it for the last three weeks. Last week was extremely successful. So there were some learning curves, just creating a new flow through the restaurant and how people exit, took some communication with our staff, a lot of learning. This flyer got better. It wasn't, uh, didn't communicate the pickup spot as well. So we, we put up more signage. So up until the last three weeks, we've been working on it and we nailed it last weekend. Okay. And have you had conversations with Uber and Lyft at all about? Trying to. Trying to change our pickup spot uh, to the drop-off location to the corner. Okay, but that's something that you're... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all my questions from now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, do we have three or five minutes? Uh, you get three, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Three? All right. Then I'll talk fast. So, thanks for joining us. To, no, I'm not... I'm, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, uh, appreciate uh, the, the presentation. Um, are you aware that, that the way this is going to work with the issuance of a dual license, I'm reading from the staff comments, the location, your location is going to be required to obtain a time-limited development permit that will be reviewed on an annual basis to determine the suitability, and that the uh, location is also going to be required to sign a good neighbor agreement, which generally outlines the requirements as well as submitting an acoustic report that will identify except. So you're aware of all those conditions that are going to come with this. Yeah, I look forward to it. Right. And so, okay, so that's, that's great. Why did you, uh, I mean, this is an odd location. I, it, I looked you up online. It looks like a really cool spot, kind of a weird location, sort of an industrial zone where you. 
Yeah, it was my ideal place. I always wanted to be in Mount Pleasant from, from starting this. Um, Vancouver is a place that everything is isolated in certain areas because of our licensing. Uh, Granville Street is extremely young. Gastown is extremely dangerous. I wanted to be somebody where there was a little bit more fun and affluent. Um, I love this neighborhood because we are three blocks off the beaten path. Uh, we do have the accessibility to be loud off our back patio and quiet up front. Um, and that we, we have neighbors from Olympic Village, we have Main Street, and we have uh, Broadway. So I love that we're a little bit off because when restaurants open in dense areas, it's, uh, it usually causes more issues. So I wanted to be in that area and I wanted to be in that area to feed my community. Uh, my goal is to be a late night dining destination, and I want my friends from Como, from Taco Fino, who are all getting off at 10, 30, and 11. They're currently going to other establishments that are open till one. Kraft, Uncle Abe's, Slim's, Narrow, they're all my neighbors within a, a kilometer, and I'm not getting any of the business because they are going to support my competitors. So on, on the subject of business, because I realize you recently opened, it looks pretty like you, you spent some money on this place, and... and we know that inflation pressures are, are happening and stuff. What does this, is, what does this dual license mean for your business viability? If I can ask. Straight up, it's my success. I'm currently failing. Uh, I'm currently losing money. Um, uh, nothing that's that's detrimental at this point, but we're not profitable. We have not been profitable for six months, uh, and we are hitting our ROI. We're just not hitting the profit side of it. Uh, we currently are rolling out lunch business, but we also need our dinner business, which is part of our business plan for the incremental night sales. This is we're currently losing forty to fifty grand, or leaving forty to fifty grand on the table that we need to uh, to become profitable. This is on account of food margins and inflation. Is that kind of the pressure point? Food is going up, but my food costs and liquor costs are all pretty static based on cost of goods. Um, so it is just the incremental sales. Our fixed cost, our everything in our restaurant stays the same. As soon as we have night sales, the labor is a very small incremental cost to the sales that are going to come in and, and, and make my business successful. He's a hard ass and he's going to make me say that it's, I'm out of time. So yeah. uh, I'm Sorry. just, no worries. I'm just noticing the time, uh, dinner time uh, that we had planned, uh, but you do have more questions. Uh, just wondering if there's the a questions. motion to extend. Yeah, motion to extend to uh, the questions to this speaker. Questions to the speaker. Yeah, okay, so moved. Okay, all those in favor say yay. Okay. Anyone opposed say nay. Okay, motion carries. Uh, up next is Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thank you. Hi, over here. Okay. Hi. Yeah, sorry, I just joined this conversation because I had, uh, I wasn't here for the first part, but um, I noticed you said, and I haven't been to your space because I spent an awful lot of time here, um, although I've been wanting to, to take a look at it, but it, you noticed that you said one of the things you're doing is closing the patio front doors, and I'm just trying to visualize, I've looked at some photos, is it an open patio, but how, how are the doors closed to a patio? Yeah, so the developer Conwest built the restaurant use space with nano walls. If you're familiar with those, they're the accordion doors that open the entire space up that's 20 feet by 8 feet high. So my space is a large rectangle with two patios on each side, and the doors open completely. So my space looks open throughout. So on my front patio, um, our basically our inside pours outside, and we close those doors completely at 9 o'clock, which stops any of the inside sound, and then we vacate the patio at 10. Okay, and then the does it remain sort of open on the, on the top then? You on the back until 11 when we have to close the, uh, the patios. Okay, and presumably that's to mitigate... Any sort of noise at that point? At yeah, I'm doing it to be a good neighbor. I'm doing it above and beyond my 11 p.m. I could close. I just know with the families, with the complaints that I've gotten, it's better for my business to close at 10 and, and quiet it down at 9 o'clock. Okay. Um, and did you have my, what, can you just recap, and I'm sorry if you've re you said this before, but what, what's sort of the frequency of complaints that you've gotten or how have they gotten to you? Because you said you didn't, hadn't received direct phone calls. So I haven't received any complaints. I got the one with the police the next day. So I was in the restaurant while uh, the incident in hand were, were uh, eight of our guests. There were uh, a friend of our, our employee named Gareth. Half of the group are young and not drinkers. Uh, they left the restaurant after I was inside doing managerial duties. And what they did was vandalize my property. They took Christmas lights off plastic ones, off my, my building and started throwing them at each other uh, and took cones. So this was all vandalizing my property. Uh, and I first heard about it the, the next day when every neighbor has my cell phone number. Okay, so that video circulating that obviously caused some frustration for neighbors was also frustrating for you as well. I, I filed a police report the next day. You did? Okay. And what was the police response to it? I haven't heard back. We keep talking. Okay. Um, 
But do you feel, I guess the question being, because um, I appreciate that it takes a while to work out the kinks um, of this and neighborhoods are changing and evolving and growing and also wanting to be responsive to resident feedback. you feel comfortable and confident the measures you're putting in place are sort of genuine good faith efforts and you can address some of the issues? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an empath at heart. Like, I really want people to like me. I'm a people pleaser, and I want to work closely with my neighbors. I think I'm showing everything I can to go above and beyond and listen to the feedback and, and fight to make it quieter for them. So I'm absolutely confident. Uh, this hour is crucial for my business to succeed, and I will continue to be better with my neighbors. I will not stop learning from my mistakes and, and becoming better because of them. Okay, that's my time. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Domnato. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks for being here, and appreciate a um, number of questions have been asked of you already. I appreciate, I was looking at your flyer you said you've developed just in the last six weeks around exiting through the back alley to sort yeah. of mitigate noise. I'm, I'm curious if you, um, given what we've heard from a number of the neighbors about the noise of having that be even earlier than 10 p.m., of having people exit, you know, more by maybe 9 o'clock, or is there any, is that something you've thought about as sort of... Um, yes, very good question. We we actually started at nine. It was just a bit awkward. It's still bright out. People are finishing dinner. It's like it's it's not. It's still loud outside. Cars are going by. It's the outside vibe. In my opinion, didn't require us to be quieter outside between nine and ten. But if it is, I'm totally in. Okay. It was just awkward making people like out the back when it was bright and not loud out. Yeah. No. No. I appreciate it. And um, uh, I'm also, I'm just curious if the do you, do you operate any other businesses right now in Vancouver? Um, this is my very first business, and this is okay. all independently funded. This is no big money. I don't come from money. This is the house that I worked with my partner to save. It's all on the line. I have personal guaranteed against it, double private equity mortgage, and I have four friends that cash is all in. Mm. We, have, we have no Fullers, Aquilinis, or Gagliardis here. This is just creatives taking a risk. No, I appreciate that. And I, I know um, my dad had a small business and I know it's not easy. Um, I, I just want to ask one more question just in the context of, of the, the session that was held with the neighbors facilitated by um, your consultant. Is, is, um, have you had an opportunity to have that kind of face-to-face -face discussion previously with the neighbors or is it something that could be more on an ongoing basis in, through a good It's network? ongoing. So when I first opened, it was gangbusters. We didn't expect to have the press of the most anticipated restaurant in Vancouver. So our first six weeks with the sun was just, it was, we were trying to get a wrap on it and keeping our head above water. Um, and at that point, I was quite disruptive in learning as we went and we were talking. And then when the patio closed, there wasn't much concern over the winter months. Uh, we didn't have a lot of communication until the, uh, the, the six weeks ago information session. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, trying to balance it, you know, you're hearing today from, from neighbors um, with sort of, you know, your desire to have a, a, a thriving, you know, small business is maybe that is an opportunity as part of a time-limited, you know, development permit to sort of more engagement and sort of course correction as you go. But anyways, I, I, will, I would love I it. That's my time chair. But I, yeah, I would love more time with the neighbors. Like I said, they do have my number. Darren, the one speaker, is who I do talk with. Uh, him and I, I stop by his patio. We'll catch up and, and, and chat as much as we can. So he is the one neighbor I am in contact with out of the group as a point of contact. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Councillor Joe. Yeah, so I think very similar as uh, Councillor Dominado's question, so, but I want to be more specific. So do you have a future plan or strategy to engage the, your neighbors? Yeah, so I continue wanting to work with them as often as possible. Ever since six weeks ago, I tried to start a WhatsApp group with everybody with no luck. I really want to engage with my neighbors. Uh, at this point, it's just uh, there's a bit of polarity, but I believe we can get there. And I will continue to work as hard as I can to mitigate the sound and, and be a good neighbor. Regardless of the outcome here, like I am going to be a, a fantastic neighbor. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Cameron, for answering all those questions. And uh, we are going to break for dinner and uh, resume at 5.30. So thanks, everybody.
Hey, Lovia, can you hear us? Affirmative. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are back in session, um, continuing with speakers. And uh, we, we will go to speaker number 12, uh, Ben Ross. Uh, do we have Ben on the phone? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Ben. So you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Hello, Mayor Sim and Council. Thank you for your time today. My name is Ben, and I'm a frequent guest of the 0 to 100 block of West 6th Ave. My partner and friends live on the block right across from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision. I am in opposition to this motion. I wanted to quickly touch on Cam's comments we heard just before the break. Um, as much as I like him as a person and wish him great success, this notion that he's putting forth that there's been no reach out on behalf of residents to complain is false. I believe you have access to the several police reports made by residents. We've been advised by the city to make our complaints there. Considering there was zero reach out whatsoever from Cameron when MPVP was readying its grand opening, I urge you to recognize that good faith reach outs need to be happening from both sides, and that was not something Cam appeared to take seriously from the very start. Now, I'd like to use the rest of my time today to read a letter from David Green, owner of Sacred Heart Tattoo, located at 25 West 6th Avenue, a few, door down, a few doors down from Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision. It is important to hear voices of other businesses in this conversation, so I'm happy to share on his behalf. So, from David, his letter reads, Along with my business partner, we have run our business for 30 years 
in Vancouver. After hearing studio, after, after having studios in Kitsilano, the West End, and in the Granville Entertainment District, we chose to relocate to Mount Pleasant, specifically the, bo- the block we are on, for its potential for creativity and its community. After having experienced the havoc of running a business in the Granville Entertainment District, we found Mount Pleasant Industrial Park in the community was quite inviting. A thriving area creatively with the art studios, busy walk-by traffic with many restaurants and breweries in and around the area, as well as the residential community that lives and works in the area. There are plenty of young families who spend much of their time in the parks and using the facilities provided. The block we are on holds block parties, kid-friendly, and the park, oh, sorry, block parties, kid-friendly, and the park adjacent to our, our block is a regular provider of concerts and events. After having MPVP open at 67 West 6 last year, we have experienced a noticeable increase in not only the noise level from the outdoor sound system they are using at full volume, but the amount of vandalism, trash, broken beer bottles, restaurant glasses, as well as, once again, reminiscent of our time on Granville Street, having to clean vomit and, and human waste from our vestibule regularly. Not to mention the inadequate venting system that was allowed to be installed for the wood-burning stove which vents into the alley a heavy burning smell throughout the day. We have installed extra cameras and security to help track where this is all coming from. As is noted, the business at 67 West 6 is the genus of all these issues. When the building was planned and the community was advised about this development, the plan was for a restaurant not unlike what exists presently in the area. What we got is a club masquerading as a restaurant. The community and area does not need nor would benefit from a full licensed liquor primary. The owners of the premises have shown that they are not able to work in consideration to the immediate community, both residential and commercial, nor have they shown that they respect the guidelines and restrictions that their present license outlines. This was a talking point when the developer outlined plans for for a restaurant licensed premises on the block, which we were assured was not going to be a liquor primary for the obvious reasons above. I believe if you look at the police and calls made regularly about and to this address, you will see the flagrant disregard for their license at present. More so, this establishment establishment needs to have more oversight and consequence before they are considered for a change in licensing. licensing. I appreciate you taking the time to consider my thoughts and allow me to air our grievances as well as the thoughts of our residential community and and the surrounding businesses. The concern for the community, neighborhood, and potential and present goodness that is thriving in Mount Pleasant is justified. The current management and ownership of this business do not have the community's best interests at heart. Regards, David Green, Sacred Heart Tattoo. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you. Uh, next speaker is Speaker 13, Katie uh, River- Riversill. Hello, everyone. Um, My name is Katie Reverso, and I'm here to voice the support for Mount Pleasant Restaurant to receive their primary liquor license. As a female in my 40s and a resident of the East Vancouver area, I understand the importance of a fun and safe community. Mount Pleasant Restaurant is a fantastic new place that has really brought the community together. You've really seen it um, with their delicious wood-fired food, quality service, and a safe place to gather. This is most important to me. I, the, the addition of the liquor license will not only enhance my dining experience and add a little bit more fun to Vancouver, but it will also provide a safe place for me to get good food and drink after midnight um, in my neighborhood, which is very, very important, and not on Granville Street. I want to stay within my, my neighborhood. Um, this will also provide me some diversity um, within the restaurant scene. I also have to say that I was at the restaurant on Saturday night, and I'm kind of surprised to see what I heard, or to hear what I had, because when I went in there, the server actually gave me one of those inserts and said, please exit through the, the back entrance. And I um, went to actually go to the front where the owner was standing and told me that I need to go through and be quiet. So it was very interesting to hear. I don't know how the, the other two weeks were. I wasn't there on a Saturday night, but I can assure you that on 
on Saturday night. I left about 11.35. I exit through the back and I was told where to pick up my Uber. So I think there's really something here where I can tell as someone who's a very, very, I love going to that restaurant, that they are really, really trying to make a change. So in conclusion, I really support um, um, Mount Pleasant and their pr pursuit for a primary liquor license. It's essential for the growth and development of our community and small businesses. It will provide residents like myself um, more options for dining and socializing after midnight, and it will really make Vancouver a more fun and diverse city. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Speaker 14, uh, Debbie Scholler. Uh, do we have Debbie here? Yes, you do. Oh, Hi, my name is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Yep, yep. So Hi. Uh, my name, thank you. My name is Debbie. I'm 74 years young. I live in the area, and I am the mother of three adult children. I strongly support the application of Mount Pleasant Vintage to extend their hours of operation, as this is a great, safe location that is in a unique area where um, I would be extremely comfortable having my children or myself go for a, a late-night food or beverage. I would welcome more establishments like this in my backyard. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, next speaker, Speaker 15, uh, Christine Van. Do we have Christine on the phone? Yes, I, hello? Hi, Christine. So you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Christine Van, and I am in support of the liquor primary application for Mount mm -hmm. Pleasant, Vintage and Provision. I have been in the restaurant and bar industry for over 34 years in Gastown, Yaletown, and Granville Street. I've ran many bars and restaurants myself, and I've worked for, worked with, mm -hmm. and seen very good and not so good operators. And I can assure you, that Cameron Bogue is a very good operator. I've known him for over 15 years from when he opened uh, Daniel Booth's restaurant on 4th Avenue. I couldn't be happier and more proud of him when he opened up Mount Pleasant Vintage and uh, This has been his lifelong dream, and he has put everything on the line to make this happen, to create a place where everyone is welcome, where I, a 51-year-old female, can come and feel safe and be part of his family. After hearing his neighbors earlier, it sounds like there has been some challenges, which is truly unfortunate. However, knowing what I know about Cam, he's already addressed some of his issues, and he will continue to be proactive in ensuring not only his guests are safe, but also his neighbors. Now, Cam is very committed. He's very dedicated to his craft. This is his passion and his life's work, and I really, truly urge all of you to give him a chance. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Debbie. Uh, next speaker is Speaker 16, uh, Craig Blyes. Do we have Craig on the phone? Yes, you do. Okay, uh, so you have up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. You know, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, members of the City Council and residents of Mount Pleasant. Um, you know, just thank you first for providing me the opportunity to speak and, you know, in support of Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions application for a new uh, dual license. Uh, my name is Craig Blyes. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for uh, Earl's Restaurant. And, um, and, and graciously and, and, and excitedly, I'm so happy that our head office is moving, you know, from Gastown currently to, uh, to become a neighbor of all of yours. Uh, very soon in uh, in Mount Pleasant. So uh, we're very excited to be a part of that community. Uh, but today, or tonight, I really wanted to call in and advocate for a business that not only uh, enriches our local economy, but also contributes to the cultural fabric of really our city. And so this dual license for Mount Pleasant uh, Vintage and Provisions will not only benefit the establishment itself, but also create a positive impact on our community as a whole. And so first, you know, before, before I begin, I just want to talk about Cam's, uh, Cam Boak's character and, and who he represents. You know, he is the owner of Mount Pleasant uh, Vintage and Provisions, um, and, and I've had the privilege of working with Cam for over a decade at Earl's Restaurant. And I can personally attest to his dedication, his integrity, and professionalism. 
the cool thing about Cam is that he possesses a rare combination of business acumen and a genuine concern for the well-being of others. He has consistently demonstrated empathy, always looking out for others, and fostering a strong sense of community. He believes in inclusiveness and wants the best, not only for his establishment, but truly for the community and the city as a whole. There is no better steward for Mount Pleasant than Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. Secondly, I can't even tell you how excited our team is from Earl to move to Mount Pleasant. We have 150 team members at head office, and we're looking forward to being a part of this community. This community embraces individuality. It embraces creativity and entrepreneurship. And we get to work and play in an eclectic neighborhood of residents and businesses. Independent restaurants, like Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provision, play a crucial role in shaping the culinary landscape of our community. By granting this dual license, we help strengthen the unique character of our neighborhood. We encourage a vibrant um, uh, food culture, and that incorporates both exceptional dining and responsible liquor service. It also it also allows Mount Pleasant to cater to the diverse needs of patrons in Mount Pleasant and be able to cater to their needs in other areas. And we can't forget in the restaurant industry how devastating the impact of COVID-19 uh, has been. You know, closure of businesses during the lockdown uh, took a significant toll, not only on owners, employees, and the community at large. But by supporting Mount Pleasant Vintage of Provisions, we have an opportunity to help rebuild and strengthen our local economy, as well as promote the resurgence of the hospitality sector. It will also generate increased revenue, create jobs, and contribute to the overall economic health of our city. Finally, for the betterment of Mount Pleasant community, I strongly urge the City Council to grant Mount Pleasant Vintage of Provisions a new dual license. By doing so, we will not only support a responsible business owner with a deep, deep passion to prove, to prove his commitment to the community, but we'll also contribute to the growth and diversification of the restaurant industry and strengthen the economic and social fabric of the beloved Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Thank you, City Council. Hey, thanks, Craig. Uh, we'll go to Speaker 17, uh, Ray Leung. Uh, do we have Ray on the phone? Speaker 17 is not on the line. Okay, we'll come back to them. Uh, speaker number 18, Shane Eli, or Ellie, in person. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shane Eli, and I'm here to voice my full support for Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions to receive their dual liquor license. Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions is a unique place in Vancouver that is a true neighborhood bar and restaurant that boasts a staff full of hospitality veterans. It, also, it is also owned and operated by a community-minded business person who has gone, gone above and beyond to work with people in his neighborhood to maintain their quality of life. A little about Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions. For those of you who haven't been, it's a neighborhood bar and gathering place for local residents, and there are no other liquor primary primary or dual license establishments within 750 meters. So it gives a unique options to residents in the area while also bringing in new foot traffic. After reading the briefing, there are significantly more people in support of the license extension than there are opposed, 28 to 11. Vancouver does get the moniker no fun city. Places like this are making the more city more fun and culturally relevant and doing it in a mature and responsible way. That's what Vancouver needs more of. The owner and operator, Cam Bogue, is a hospitality industry legend who has worked his entire life to get to the point where he could open his own restaurant. He has also taken the time and effort to, to make significant actions to work with his neighbors. Those neighbors did have some co concerns, which I'd like to address now. Increased noise. In the briefing, it shows the most recent noise complaint was October 2022, and it was found to be unsubstantiated. I don't see why adding an hour to service changes this. The bar has also agreed to hire private security to monitor patrons leaving the establishment, as you heard from Cam. They've also removed all speakers on the front patio, 
are putting menu inserts in their menus handed to every guest after 9 p.m., reminding them to be quiet and having them exit out the back door. On top of that, Cam has given his personal cell phone number to all residents in the area to let them know if there is any issues. Parking and traffic concerns. Again, parking in the area, being light industrial, is abundant at night. Again, I don't see how adding an hour to service times affects the parking availability or cause traffic concerns at this time at night, especially when most people will be walking, using public transits, taxi or ride sharing, which again, Cam has said, will be moving off of that block. In conclusion, this is not a nightclub being frequented by 19 to 25 year olds. It's an older crowd looking for a good cocktail and late night food in an up and coming vibrant neighborhood. Cam Bogue and his team are veterans of the hospitality industry who clearly want to work with their neighbors to ensure a harmonious relationship between his neighborhood bar and the residents of the neighborhood. Vancouver's mission statement is to create a great city of communities which cares about its people, its environment, and the ability to live, work, and prosper. Cam and his team at Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions are shining examples of this. Vancouver should be supporting small business owners, especially ones that are so willing to work with their community. And as such, I see no good reason to deny Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions their license extension. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, speaker number 19, uh, John Smolensky. Uh, do we have John on the phone? Speaker number 19 has withdrawn. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaker number 20, Mark Halatic. Do we have Mark here in person? We're on the phone. Okay, I'm just going to check. No? Speaker number 20 is not on the line. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaker number 21, Brett Parker. Brett on the floor. Hello, Councillors and Mayor. Hi, Brett. So you have up to five minutes. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Brett Parker, and uh, thanks for allowing me to speak today. I'm a local Vancouver resident looking to voice my support for Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, or MPV, receiving their dual liquor license. The team at MPV have created a unique and exciting neighborhood bar in an old heritage home in Mount Pleasant, Vancouver. <clears throat> the space is welcoming and creative. It really fits the arts and culture mold that the city of Vancouver is looking to foster. MPV is catering to an older cocktail drinking demographic with exceptional cocktails, affordable pricing, great happy hour, and even an industry night to give back to Vancouver's food and beverage employees. With many different types of industry in the area, there's a need for both early morning and late night offerings, which this dual license will allow MPV to cater to. The MPV staff have handled all incidents within the neighborhood, like the hospitality veterans that they are, including holding a public hearing and providing a direct number to voice any and all concerns. They have removed the speakers from the front patio, sacrificing revenue to close an hour earlier than the bylaw each night <clears throat> to appease their local neighbors. The sound system inside the bar is amazing with great jukebox favorites, but even so, I haven't heard anything from being outside standing on the street directly in front of the bar. They've agreed to an acoustical report to ensure that they are doing everything in their power to limit disturbances by their business operations. New procedures with the doorman will help usher guests as well as the Uber and Lyft uh, pickup area being out the back door. With rideshare apps in Vancouver, it's easier and faster than ever to get to your next destination in our city. MPV has gone over and above to cater to all the needs of our Vancouver locals. They offer a unique food and beverage experience in Mount Pleasant with what seems to be an exemplary record for noise and nuisance in a light industrial area. Other than a single substantiated incident in which they have been extremely active in pursuing to grow and learn from, they have been amazing members of our community and are even eager to sign a good neighbor agreement. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not sure what more we can ask of Mr. Bogue and his team at Mount Pleasant Vintage and Provisions, but I'm sure if we did ask for anything, they'd do their best to deliver. I hope to welcome many more establishments that embody the values of MPV in the near future. Thanks for letting me speak today. Hey, thanks, Brett. 
Uh, next speaker is speaker number 22, uh, Mika Du. Do we have Mika on the line? Speaker 22 is not on the line. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last speaker, speaker 23, Sean Layton. Do we have Sean on the line? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So you have up to five minutes, Sean. Great. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, counselors and mayor. Um, I wish I could come. I'm literally in my car outside the restaurant. Um, I, outside of my restaurant, um, like Cam, I'm an entrepreneur and a business owner in Mount Pleasant. I own uh, Como Taperia, which is close by. And um, for, for me, um, I love the restaurant. Cam's a friend and colleague. We worked um, collectively together. Um, for a long time, I've always respect um, him and his business. And as a frequent customer of Mount Pleasant Vintage, um, I've only ever seen a very professional run business. It is nothing like a nightclub. Uh, it's a restaurant and it's, uh, they do a great job. Their wood fire grill is very unique. I believe there's only three in the province. I might be wrong. Um, but that's something that, uh, you know, makes me want to go and makes me want to talk about it. But most importantly for this license, you know, I have 25 to 30 staff every night and a lot of them work really long days. Um, a lot of them live in Mount Pleasant or farther east. Um, and they need somewhere to go after work, you know, and we close at 11 and, you know, a lot of them get out of there at 12, 1230 and there's not a lot of options. They definitely don't want to go down to the Granville Strip or down to the east side, might not be safe and it might not be in their direction. Um, and when they do get off, there isn't a lot of options and definitely there's not a lot of options for food. So this is something to me, like personally, I'm not one that stays up that late, but uh, most of my staff do. And um, when Cam told me about this, I thought it was a no-brainer. It's in a light industrial zone. Unfortunately, there's always going to be someone that's going to have to listen to um, people exiting a restaurant, us included. We're at the bottom of a tower on Main and 7th. Um, but like I said, we do close at 11. And they're always going to have bad apples, but it sounds like Cam's doing a great job of mitigating the complaints. And I couldn't think of a better area um, for something like this because I do believe these licenses – need to go to other parts of the city. If they're all on Granville Street, like, no one's going there and no one wants to go there after you get off work. There is a thing that, you know, there's nightclubs and things like that. But, you know, if you get off work and you just cooked for 12 hours, you just want to go have a beer and a hamburger or something like that at 1230, you don't have those options in Mount Pleasant. You know, there's a couple of places, but there's not a ton. So going into that neighborhood, I don't, I really don't see... Um, <clears throat> what the what the problem would be. I think it's a great addition to the neighborhood. And I do feel like the team, um, Cam and his crew, are doing a great job to try and, you know, meet the neighbors halfway. Um, the things like the Uber as well as um, exiting out the back, that seems like they're going above and beyond. And I feel like they'll probably um, continue to do so. So I am in full support um, for Mount Pleasant Vintage. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Thanks for calling in. Thanks. Um, okay, so we are now just going to go back through the list of speakers uh, that we didn't, um, that weren't available earlier. Uh, speaker number 17, do we have Ray Leung on the line? No, not on the line. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about speaker 20, Mark Vladek? No, not, not here. Okay. And speaker 22, Mika Du. No, not on the line. Okay, thank you. Okay, would someone like to move a motion? Okay, moved by Councillor Fry. Um, Council, is there any discussion? Councillor Fry. Yeah, um, appreciate everybody coming to speak today. Um, and I, I want to address the, the neighbors specifically because I, I get. Uh, your concerns, and we and, and we heard them. Um, you know, I've I once lived in a similar sort of situation in a kind of a house in an industrial area where we weren't uh, used to. We 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 had a nice quiet zone because there wasn't anything going on in the evening. Um, but this area is zoned industrial. This is a, a kind of a, a valid use in this area, and things change, unfortunately, and. You know, I, I get that change can be difficult, and this is going to impact your neighbors um, and you. But I also recognize that the 
um, you know, this is a legitimate dual licensing is a is an appropriate kind of offering that the province has given us. And I do believe that with the conditions that we apply as the city and through our licensing department, that there will be the proper checks and balances. I do think that the operator has been kind of served notice on this and and sir you're going to have to really come correct because we will be looking at this and 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 I know that our staff are going to be doing reviews of your your project to make sure that it is sort of compliant and that you're not unduly disturbing the the neighbors and I do think that you know at face value what you're you're promising and committing to do to us here is carries a lot of weight and a responsibility and um and I recognize as well that you've invested a lot in this in this restaurant, and you went with a, a location that was outright zoned for this kind of use, and uh, you're going by the rules. and And I do, uh, you know, I do want to come back to the there was that one comment about the red solo cups in the side yard, and that you don't serve. And I guess that is sort of the unfortunate reality when you're kind of a lightning rod for the controversy. And in that case, obviously, it wasn't your product; it was somebody else's causing that mess. And I'm not saying that you're not absolved of any guilt in, in, the, in the nuisance that the neighbors are reporting, and I, and I, and I trust that you're going to move forward on it. But I, I, I will support this dual license application based on the, the, the mutual trust and uh, the expectation that you're going to do right by your neighbors and that open communication and the good neighbor kind of agreement work that we hope to see. That's me. Um, pass the mic. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I've been listening intently to the conversation, and I was concerned when we received uh, some video and uh, some communication from some of the residents. And I wear dual hats, um, as I think we often all do as councillors, um, in terms of being responsive to all the residents in the city of Vancouver, but also wanting to create a vibrant and a fun city and an environment where a small business can uh, thrive and prosper. Um, it is a growing city. Neighbourhoods are changing. Um, particularly down here um, in this area in Mount Pleasant. Uh, we've got the Broadway plan development, got a lot of that sort of creative hub um, and inspiration and a lot of those um, businesses are changing and you're starting to see obviously um, more intensification of land uses uh, because, and so as we do that, we're going to go through some growing pains in terms of different uses um, existing in different, uh, sort of in, within the same zones in the same areas. Um, I'm, I think that, the important thing here is that I imagine it's not a particularly um, enjoyable experience for Cameron to be here um, and to go through this because his business is on the line. And I can imagine it was also frustrating if you were a resident and you were experiencing some of that. And, you know, council is doing its best to be objective and parse through what's related to the restaurant, uh, what was related to other factors. Um, but we do have uh, sort of the components of a good neighbor agreement, uh, which council takes fairly seriously um, in terms of looking at those. And um, there's also, uh, I have seen times here where there have been cases that have come back to council. And if you have somebody that doesn't deliver on those expectations, then licenses um, are not necessarily given in perpetuity. Those issues and business licenses can be revoked. So I think it's incumbent on everybody to be sort of um, in good faith uh, to sort of be good actors and move this forward. Um, I followed this project for a while because uh, I was aware the developer that's behind this one is one that's done some interesting things in terms of intensifying industrial land use. Um, and it was uh, really intriguing and unique to see the retention of sort of the heritage piece attached to it. And I've actually been wanting to go down and see it for a while. So it's interesting to be having this conversation. I haven't done that. I do aspire to do that, actually, if I get out of this council chamber um, at some point. Um, but I think that we do want what we're aspiring to in the city of Vancouver is diverse, complete communities where people could not just live and they can work, but they can also have fun. And there are things to do. And I think we, that means that we also need to be respectful and find out ways for those pieces to live alongside. So um, I think at this point, we're talking about a licensing change. We're not necessarily talking about whether or not um, this particular business deserves to operate. We're actually, the decision from the council tonight is around this dual licensing piece, which we need to look at and say, is it equitable that we would withhold it from one business when it's something that's available um, for the most part to um, all businesses and we've been trying to provide that flexibility in operation because it's a really expensive city um, in terms of leasing and um, no matter what kind of business you're running, retail, hospitality, people are trying to deliver on that high overhead with making maximum use of their space. So um, I have full expectations that the operator is going to do their best to deliver it. 
Um, I'm hopeful that the neighbors will come to see this to be a good addition to their neighborhood and somewhere that they like to enjoy um, and they can kind of call their local. Um, and I have no doubt that council will um, hear if there's any ongoing challenges and we'll be receptive to listening to it at that time. But um, I think we deserve to kind of give this one a shot. It, there, we do need some additional services in that neighborhood. Most of it falls on the north side of six towards Olympic Village. Um, and you don't see much sort of on that that other side there. There's a few sort of pop-up breweries and other spots, but it certainly provides, I think, a different experience than is available currently. So all that said, uh, reflecting some of the same sentiments as Councillor Fry, um, but really hearing the neighbors that um, they're going to sort of put any concerns forward in good faith, provided they operate the benefit of the doubt, and the operator is going to do their best to address them. Um, so I will support it. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Montague. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm I'm one of the new guys in this chamber, uh, and one of the things I have to remind myself sometimes is, you know, what we're being asked to do here, and it's to consider uh, a dual license in an industrial zone. In this specific case, um, before I came to council, I was 28 years with the VPD, and I can tell you there's nothing more frustrating than dealing with uh, a restaurant or bar or pub. Uh, with an owner that is um, difficult to deal with. Um, and I don't see that here. Um, I don't know Cam. Uh, I've never met you before, but uh, you seem to have uh, good answers to a lot of the questions and concerns that I had. Um, I'm hoping that uh, as time goes on, you and your neighbors will be able to communicate a little bit better. Um, there's no doubt this is a new business. There's going to be some growing pains. Uh, I know if I lived in this neighborhood, I probably wouldn't be too happy with with noise at you know midnight, one in the morning. Um, but I also know that it's in Cam's best interest. Uh, he's got a uh, a huge financial investment here that he obviously doesn't want to lose. It's in his best interest to make this work and to make it work with his neighbors. Um, and this is conditional on a good neighbor agreement, noise requirements. Uh, acoustical reports. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the concerns, but uh, based on what I see here, the report and, and all the speakers, uh, I'm going to be in support of the dual license at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Klassen. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I, in, uh, I'm sort of uh, in the same uh, uh, points to make here is Councillor Montague, and it's um, that uh, the, our job here is to really address the licensing. But um, uh, as somebody who's been a strong community advocate and, and had to dial 911 on a few occasions because of um, either sort of rowdy behavior that's in the community or something like that, I fully understand and appreciate how frustrating that must be. But I do feel like this is a point in time. Um, I'm listening and I hear um, an experienced and, and I think potentially a um, uh, person who exhibits uh, being a responsible owner trying to start a new business. Um, and I'm hoping that the uh, that there are bridges built and some goodwill can, uh, can be found here. Uh, I also feel like um, I'm hearing a little bit from the surroundings uh, that uh, there might be other mitigating factors. So I uh, not just uh, the, the premises itself. So um, I will be su uh, supporting the change in license, but I think um, I really do hope um, that uh, uh, that more uh, work uh, continues to try and build uh, good relations with the community. And I think some of the measures that have been put in place in the last several weeks uh, regarding you know where people should uh, exit, uh, pick up an Uber, or where they smoke, what have you. Uh, we'll, we'll go a long way to trying to mitigate some of the things that um, uh, happened at the early part of the start of this business. And uh, I'm also hearing that uh, uh, the proprietor is, is, is probably a learned a lot from this experience as well. So um, with that, um, because this uh, license does have conditions attached to it, I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Klassen. Councillor Joe. Yeah, I think my colleagues said a lot, so I'm going to keep my... Uh, my my speech very quick. So I think uh, yeah. Again, I think I like to support uh, this uh, dual licensing application because uh, you know first I checked your Google reviews. Very good uh, review on the uh, by the by the people over there. So I really believe this is going to be a very good addition 
and very good asset to the neighborhood. And also, the, uh, you, I think I asked the question regarding your future strategy and the commitment in engaging the community. And you said that loud and clear. So you're going to your, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna put your effort in the, in the future, engaging the community. So I really like to give this small business, which is really essential to our local economy in Vancouver, give this small business, business opportunity for continued thrive, continued development. And also, I really believe there's a good neighbor uh, agreement. So it's a really good program. So I'm really glad uh, you're going to be uh, signing this agreement with the, with the city. So with all that, yes, I'm going to support uh, this application. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Councillor Joe. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, I'm now going to call the vote. Uh, Clerk, if you could take us to the voting screen. And Council, if you could please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, so motion carries. Uh, absent is Councillor Carr, Councillor Bly, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Sim. But motion carries. Okay, eighth item on the agenda is uh, 1728 Commercial Drive, uh, 128646 BC Limited, Osita, uh, Liquor Primary License Application, Liquor Establishment Class 2. Does any member wish to declare a conflict on this item? Okay, we have team members from development, building, and licensing uh, in the chambers here to present the item. Oh, we've just lost quorum. We'll just need to take a recess. Really wish people would consider. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, pick back up. We're on eight, the eighth, eighth item on the agenda. Councillor Joe, don't make me use my gavel. Um, we have team members from development, uh, building and licensing here to present the item. So I'd like to invite them to the podium. I see you are there. Please introduce yourselves again. Good evening, Council. I'm Sarah Hicks. I'm the Chief License Inspector uh, in Development, Buildings and Licensing. Uh, and uh, staff are here tonight. Uh, available for questions uh, on the application for a liquor primary uh, license at 1728 Commercial Drive. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions uh, from council? Okay, I don't see any questions, so we will now hear from uh, registered speakers for the item. Uh, speaker number one is uh, Mika Du. Do we have Mika on the phone? 
Speaker one is not on the line. Okay, thank you. Okay, so speaker number one uh, is not on the line. Um, so that's the end of the speaker's list. Yep, uh, thanks, Councillor Kirby Young has moved the motion. Council, any discussion? Okay. Um, so I, we have quorum, yeah, okay. I'm gonna now call the vote. Uh, clerk, if you could please take us to the voting screen. And council, if you could please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, motion carries. Uh, absent was Councillor Carr, Councillor Dominato, Councillor Bly, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Sim. And that com concludes the item. Thank you. Moving. Have a great night. Okay, moving right along. Tenth item on the agenda, 251 East Georgia. Blind Tiger Hospitality Limited, uh, Blind Tiger Dumplings, that sounds delicious. Dual license, liquor primary license application, liquor establishment class two. Does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on this item? Nope. Oh. So we have team members uh, once again from development, building and licensing here to present the item. Um, good evening. Good evening again. <laughs> uh, staff are available for questions uh, on this report if there are any. Great. Um, so, Council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions um, of uh, staff. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah. Councilor Kirby Young. I have one procedural question, Chair. Do we yes. have the opportunity to waive speakers? Um, I don't believe, well, I guess there are speakers for this, aren't there? Let me just um, confer I, with the I clerk. Believe, I believe it's at Council's discretion to do that. Okay, I'm just going to confer with the clerk and I'll get back to you in a sec. Thanks. No, because it's in regular council. Uh, Councilor Kirby Young, uh, we do have speakers that are on the list that are present in the chamber, so we are going to hear from speakers. Oh, yeah, I'll turn it on. Um, I appreciate that, but I'm reading the of the room and I do believe it's within council's purview to move to waive speakers and council can vote accordingly but I'd like to move to waive speakers. Okay just a moment while I confer with the clerk. We're just gonna need a short recess for a minute. Thanks.
for him. Okay, Mike, please stop leaving. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we do need a motion to waive speakers. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yes, I'd like to move to suspend the procedure by law and yeah. uh, waive hearing speakers so we can proceed directly to debate okay. and decision. Yeah. So that's a two-third vote. So all those in favor say yay. Okay. Although also anyone opposed say nay. Okay, motion carries. Okay. And I'd like to move the recommendations. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor. Uh, we shall shall do that. Um, okay, just one moment here. Okay, Council, is there any discussion? Okay, see no discussion. Um, I'm now going to call the vote. So, Clerk, if you could please take us to the voting screen, and Council, if you could please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, motion carries. Uh, Councillor Carr is absent. Councillor Dominato is absent. Councillor Bly is absent. Councillor Boyle is absent. And Mayor Sim is absent. And that concludes uh, the item. Thank you. Okay, the 11th item on the agenda is 23 West Cordova Street, 1220123 BC Limited, Blood Alley Music Hall, event. Uh, driven liquor primary license application. Does any member wish to declare a conflict on this item? Okay, uh, so we have once again our uh, team member from development building and licensing here to present this item, Sarah Hicks. Unless more participants join, this conference will end in. Okay, uh, so uh, I'd like to. Um, uh, Council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of, uh, of team members. So are there any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, um, we do have one speaker for this. Uh, Councilor Kirby Young? Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question of, of uh, our Chief License Inspector, and that is, um, it, how unique is this specific application? Uh, great question. Um, I. It's a fairly unique application in that it is uh, two stories below grade, uh, and it is going to be an event-driven license, so for a cultural, uh, cultural arts and culture, uh, live performance-related venue. Uh, there aren't very many uh, assembly uses below grade uh, in the city. We'll put your mic back on. Thank you. Um, and then just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, when uh, the license department is looking at this, are you considering the linkage into other city policies, such as the dramatic shortage of live performance value venues yeah. and the loss of music space? And can you speak about um, the need for that in the city? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We, uh, when we receive applications uh, for for venues such as this, we work with our colleagues in our in arts and culture and community services uh, to see if if it does further uh, those kinds of policies to make sure that we're making moves in the right direction. Uh, and they have uh, uh, let staff know that they do support um, because it does create that space. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we do have one reg registered speaker for this item, and uh, they, uh, sorry, one sec here. Uh, so we'll now hear from them. It's speaker number one, Bert Hicks, or Bert Hick. Thank you. I'm not going to take much of time. I'll just be here for questions. Uh, the report speaks for itself. Uh, one thing I was going to clarify, Sarah Hicks and I are not related. Um, but um, the, this is an interesting development. You, some of you probably remember uh, the old 23 West Cordova Street nightclub, and it went downhill. It was a very uh, depressed area for quite a few years. So what West Bank has done is built a 10-story multi-use building, which will have 142 units, housing units, 80 social, and 62, but two grades below will be this music hall, which will be event-driven. And part of the reason they're doing this is Ian Gillespie loves music. And uh, so that will be a, um, a destination. The city doesn't have a lot of music halls destinations about this size, so it'll be below grade. One question that came up earlier when we were, did the neighborhood notification about security, but these will be eyes and ears on the street, and they, the security staff will be there uh, two during the 
two during night and three during the day, eyes and ears roaming the streets and also doing litter patrol and cleaning up the area. So that, I'll just stand by for any questions. We have a question from Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. I do have one question and that was really around um, just it's this is a helpful opportunity for council to get feedback around the permitting process and this venue is unique so did you find that the existing city process supported that or was it more challenging because Sorry, I can't hear you I said did you find is that better um, I know that this is an opportunity for council to hear feedback when people are going through the process and because this venue is unique did you find um, that it went smoothly with the city process or did you find that the process uh, didn't really fit because of the type of venue well, the yeah, the process we went through engagement, and as Sarah might want to speak to this as well. Um, there was some concern expressed by some of the people down there because the place has been derelict for several years, and it's been quite a few years in construction phase uh, to get this building built, and uh, so there was a concern mainly around security. Uh, and safety in the streets, but we think that this will enhance the area by having more residents down there in the in the housing, plus also having this venue. Okay, but was the city, I mean, did you feel you were forging new ground on the city process or did the existing city process for licensing venues like this suffice or was, was there parts where the policy didn't provide clear guidance on licensing a venue like this? Well, this one was an exception because it's an event-driven venue, which is allowed down there. Um, event, if you can do an event-driven venue anywhere, like you can do an event-driven venue in the Granville Street Entertainment district, gas town, Chinatown, because it's event driven. You and I won't be able to go down there tonight and have dinner, for example, or and have a burger or a beer. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to move the recommendations, Chair. Okay. Thanks, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Actually, you know what? Um, that's my, uh, I made an error. We actually have two speakers that withdrew. Um, so um, that completes the speakers list. And thanks to everyone for speaking to Council. One speaker was true, and the third speaker is not available on the line, more specifically. So thanks everyone to speaking for council on this item. Uh, Councilor Kirby Young, you moved to motion. Council, is there any discussion? I okay, see no discussion. Uh, I'm now gonna call the vote. Clerk, could you please take us to the voting screen and council, could you please register your vote on the voting panel? Okay, motion carries. Uh, absent, Councillor Carr, Councillor Dominato, Councillor Bly, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Sim. Thank you. Okay, we have one item on the agenda that was referred from the Council meeting on March 28th, 2023 to the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities in order to hear from speakers followed by debate and decision. Another reminder that amendments must be submitted to the clerk in final written form before the member introduces it. The first referred, referred motion is item 13, waterworks bylaw exemptions and or other viable exemptions for notable decorative city water features. Members motion B2, which was moved by Councillor Meisner and seconded by Councillor Carr. And our first registered speaker is Anthony Norfolk. Uh, chair, point of procedure. Yes. As this is your motion, do you not want to relinquish the chair to the vice chair? Uh, should I? Yes. During debate, usually, usually do it early. To debate. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Anthony. Thanks for your patience. Um, so you have up to five minutes. So please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for sort of bringing us here. <laughs> um, uh, Charlotte, uh, the other speaker, will not be speaking. She's one of the Harris, Harrow Park residents um, who um, has been quite affected by this situation. Uh, she's mobility impaired and she couldn't get here. Simple as that. She's given me some notes and since I obviously agree with the position she was taking anyway, <laughs> um, I, will, I will pass on her thoughts. Um, uh, the uh, particular um, uh, water feature, of course, that she's interested in is the, the um, Butte Street fountain. Um, but there are others in the West End and elsewhere um, that are affected by this. Um, 
Charlotte has particularly wanted to point out that bird activity has dropped. Fewer kids and people stopping by to engage with the seniors from Harrow Park that, for whom the Butte Street Fountain is a real focus. Um, she supports the city's reason behind all this, but says that that was arbitrary and not equitable, and the, what could have been done in advance is change it to a recirculating feature. And this applies, in fact, to all of these um, water features. Now, um, I live in the West End too, um, and there are two particular ones, one in Barclay Heritage Square and the other one uh, down on Beach Street, um, which, Beach Avenue, which is the, the Davis family, um, provided it. And that's what gets to my sort of second point, and that's what's really draw, drawn me into all this. These are centennial projects, those two. Uh, Butte Street isn't, but there are others. Um, the Peace uh, Fountain, for instance, in, on Barad Street uh, is another one that has been ceased. Um, and um, as, uh, as Councillor Classen also remembers, the whole question about the disrespect, the ignoring, the, uh, the failure to maintain centennial features is a thing which has been of concern for a while. Um, and I've tried to stir things up, but got no traction. But it really ties into what we're dealing with here on these water features. I doubt that anyone who threw the switch has recognized that we are dealing with centennial features which should have been maintained and are now turning themselves into compost heaps because they're not being cleaned up. So I'm here to remind that these features are of significance and to hope that your initiative in bringing forward this resolution um, will help us to get these features, those that need a switch to recirculation, um, get them back in operation. Uh, if for one season before they can make the switch, I think we can survive this. Um, it, it's, um, it, it, it just seems strange to me that someone somewhere just threw a switch. Um, and incidentally, some of the features already do. One, well, there's one feature in particular that, that is a recirculating feature that was switched off until I pointed the fact, the fact, point out the fact that it was recirculating. Um, there's some, there's no, no, no thought being going into this. Please pass this motion. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, you do have questions. Uh, first yes. from Councillor Classen. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Anthony. So nice to see you. Um, and, and thank you for being a steward of uh, a lot of these important uh, uh, reminders of, of the history of our city. Um, very simple question. Um, uh, do, um, do these water features um, uh, which uh, I think have been turned off for, I think for, uh, with, with good intention um, around the concerns around water usage. Do you think that there is a, um, uh, should we get into a, like a stage two or a stage three, obviously, which would be very serious uh, in terms of water? So was that something where, and I realized that the one, you mentioned the one was recirculating, but the ones that are not uh, recirculating at this time, uh, would that be just the, uh, a compromise that we can make that we could, we could uh, perhaps turn them off later on if we get into concerns around drought? Oh, yeah. Very simply. Um, I mean, that's, I think, and I think that's part of the resolution, in fact, um, that, um, yeah, if we get into trouble, we should search it off, yeah. But um, when you, I mean, I noticed the amount of, um, of power washing and stuff that goes on, and I think how much water's going down the tubes on power washing of, uh, of the parks where some of these are situated. Um, and I think, I think there's a, a disconnect here. 
And uh, just, uh, I know how I feel about them, but uh, what? how would you describe um, the value of having um, these water features um, in any part of our city, but particularly in the, in the West End? Oh, well, I, I, think it, I think it varies by feature. Um, in the case of Butte, um, that, that one is a very powerful community draw. Um, I, I'm there quite often myself. Um, uh, Charlotte is across the street from it in Harrow Park. Harrow Park is very important. It's had a psychological effect on them. Um, the Davis, oh, Davis one on Beach Avenue, not so much. Um, Barclay Heritage Square, um, that's quite a draw because in that middle of that park, it's, there are people around it. They're not around it as much as they used to be. Um, and it's, it's in rather sorry shape. It's lost, it's lost the pineapple it had on top. <laughs> um, so, that, you know, that, that's part of the thing that concerns me, maintenance. Um, so it's, it's really feature by feature. They've each got a local characteristic, a local effect. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I have some questions for you as well. Yes. I, I assume I need to relinquish, relinquish the chair for questions, or no? Nope. Okay. I don't need to. Thank you. Um, so, Anthony, you were telling me about, I understand that in 2021, you were able to get the fountain back on for the summer. Is that correct? There was a campaign to turn it back on? Yes. I wasn't really involved in that. In that I hadn't been, become involved by then. Um, that was really more Charlotte and the, the gang around her, Okay, if I can put it that way. Um, I got drawn in somewhat later. Um, uh, the thing that particularly exercised me was when I discovered that we were dealing with centennial features that um, mm -hmm. were being disrespected. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, one of the fountains that had been shut off but was actually recirculating. Which fountain was that? In Nelson Park, there's a water, water feature in the southwest corner. Uh, and I happen to know the guy who designed it. And uh, he's a very good friend of mine. And he said, that's a recirculating feature. Um, so I raised that. I think I got that into the into Vancouver Sun uh, and someone, I guess, must have been reading it because it's on now. <laughs> now it's switched on. Can you talk a little bit more about, you said there's been a psychological impact on the residents of the Harrow Park Center. Can you talk a little bit more about that, the significance of it uh, to that community? Because I know there's limited mobility. They can't necessarily travel very far. Can you tell me a little bit about that impact? Yes. Um, they had, uh, they organized quite a a sort of, media event, if I can put it that way, uh, and uh, which I attended. And I was listening to the number of people from Harrow Park for whom this was their sort of <clears throat> waterside lung, if I could put it that way. Um, it, very easy for them to reach with their walkers and, and other assistants. Um, and they would talk about how it had drawn the birds, how it, how it draw, drew the children around. Um, and um, they liked the sound of the water. Um, they talked about things like this and how important it was to them. Um, in their, uh, some of them, terribly limited physically lives. Um, and they really impressed upon me the fact that this... Was, was a lot more than just the feature. It contributed to the well-being of the people who were there. Does that help? Okay. Thanks very much, Anthony. We are at time, but uh, yeah. really appreciate that additional context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaker number two. Um, yeah, that's Charlotte. Not available. Uh, yes. Uh, just noting that uh, for the record. Uh, so that is the end of our speakers list, and uh, thanks, uh, Anthony, for coming to speak today uh, on behalf of Charlotte as well. Uh, Council, is there any discussion? Uh, Councillor Montague. Uh, yeah, Chair, thanks. I'll, I'll be brief here. Uh, you know, to some, I think on the surface, this seems like a minor issue, but to many, 
uh, and many of those uh, are seniors in our community, these features are very important. Uh, and it's just one more thing that's kind of sucking the joy out of our city. Uh, this is a problem that can be solved. So let's turn these features back on and find ways that they can be retrofitted to keep them on. Uh, I'm wholeheartedly in support of this motion that you brought forward. Um, and uh, those are my comments. Hey, uh, thanks, Councillor Montague. Councillor Klassen. Uh, in a similar vein, I'm, I'm just going to respond largely about what we've done with our fountains, uh, whether it be the, the sort of the splash that we experience when you're at the top of Queen Elizabeth Park uh, or the fountain near Harrow Park. Um, there are so many water features that we've turned off. And again, I think with good intention in mind, but I think we have to, um, first of all, um, have a sense of scale in terms of the amount of um, water circulating through them, even the ones that are not recirculating at this time. We are, in some ways, I feel like we're trying to, um, uh, again, I, I, I understand the intention of what we're trying to do with this, but I feel like we're moving into a world that is so austere um, that takes away these uh, community and urban features that I think bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. And, and people point out that uh, during uh, warm days, just the spray and just the sound of the water um, splashing is is in, in the visual and some of them are lighted. And of course, there's the uh, great big um, um, uh, fountain that would spray and um, at Lost Lagoon and other places as well. And then you know, we've even had a lot of discussion uh, about uh, kids' spray parks and so on. I, th I think we, you know, again, we need to take measures that um, that are conservation focused, but to shut off the taps, so uh, literally uh, on these things, um, before giving the public a chance to um, have some time with them is, it's, I think, was wrong, and I think it was it was a, a bit of an overreaction to um, to the concerns. Now, again, if we do get into um, severe water restrictions. Um, there are lots of things to be done. We do an enormous amount of communication to get homeowners um, to to restrict the use of their water. I think we've, as a society, we've started to you know move into devices that are reducing the overall uh, use of water. But these um, these um, places where we can have are really more collective features of our community. And, and they're for all of us to share. And again, had we built them um, uh, today rather than in the past, we would have had more recirculating. But let's, uh, let's invest in the future uh, by doing that, but not by turning everything off and deciding that we can no longer um, enjoy them uh, as, as we have. So I'm, I'm very thankful, um, Councillor Meisner, for bringing this on. I think it strikes a, a larger conversation. Again, it puts some urgency on, on investing in, in for features to recirculate and you know, putting that a part of our capital budget. But at the end of the day, I think uh, the public misses this. And, and, and I feel that um, we really do need to um, uh, re-embrace um, these important water features because they are, I think they're really central to placemaking and bringing uh, happiness to people in our community. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Klassen. Uh, I'm going to relinquish, relinquish the chair to you. Um, so um, thanks, Anthony, for coming in uh, and your comments, and also to all the people that I heard from on social media via email um, who are looking forward to uh, possibly seeing these fountains um, flowing again um this is uh a well you know it, this this amend or this motion is uh is sensitive to the fact that uh water conservation is important and that we will still be working towards uh retrofitting these fountains to be recirculating uh but in the meantime i don't think we can go another summer uh without uh some of these water features uh being turned on uh you mentioned that some of them were anthony our speaker mentioned that some of them were built for the centennial uh many of them have significance uh to different communities uh, around the city. We have, of course, the Harrow Park uh, Senior Center, a long-term care center with people with mil limited mobility issues. Uh, and this being their social uh, space that's close by that they can get to, uh, to connect with the community, to get some respite, uh, to enjoy the sound of the water. Um, that, that That's something that they really miss dearly. 
And also I heard from many um, younger people in the West End uh, that just miss having these water features in, in parks, parks that were really designed around these water features. They were a central part of the, des the design. Uh, we also have water features in Queen Elizabeth Park, for example. Um, there's a waterfall with significance to the Jewish community. We have uh, more water, water features that are more plant oriented. And I've been hearing that some of those have actually been uh, clogging up with different plants and species um, in the absence of the flowing water. So I just really want to uh, see us uh, see what we can do in terms of some bylaw exemptions to get some of these significant, uh, these water features with significant public benefit for well being in line with our healthy city strategy uh, flowing again for the summer. And if we do have a severe drought, then we will turn them off. But this is really meant to strike that balance between water conservation, the environment, but also people's mental health, well being, and enjoyment of their communities. So thank you. And I will uh, take the chair back, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I think back to the time when I uh, was first elected and I served on the Vancouver Park Board. I learned a lot about water features. And as we were going through park design um, and doing consultations with uh, the neighborhood, and water features overwhelmingly um, rated incredibly highly um, by people. And our staff had also brought forward a number of studies that really spoke to the power sorry, that really spoke to the power of um, those water features on mental health and wellness. Uh, they provide cooling, which is becoming incredibly important as we have increased temperatures, uh, heat domes we've seen in the summer, habitat for birds, uh, their natural gathering places. Um, they, they sort of calm people. And I think when we're living in an increasingly dense and urbanized environment, these are places that provide those kind of quiet moments and moments of respite that's really, really important. Um, but I think the other real takeaway here is that um, it is the aspiration, the goal, uh, I think, of the city and all of council to be climate friendly. But I think what this particular situation demonstrates is that we have, in some cases, proceeded with being guided by that goal without an actual plan in place to replace them. And the result has been that we've just been taking things away from people. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. Um, that's the takeaway. And it also sort of shows, I think, perhaps a little bit more thoughtfulness in the application. Because when you hear the story about the one water feature that's recirculating that was redesigned that way, as opposed to somebody just thought, oh, we should turn them all off. Um, because they're losing water. Um, so I, I think that's probably a good takeaway lesson to look at there. And I think this motion was thoughtful and it didn't say turn them all back on. It said look at select water features that can make that difference. Um, and so I think that's what we're doing here. I hope that one of the takeaways is that we actually do get um, some definitive information back on what it will take to reconstitute some of those water features. Um, I also learned when I was on the park board how expensive things can be. And one of the things we heard all the time is we don't have enough drinking fountains in the city. Um, and we need more of those. And people wanted to evolve those so that you could, you know, uh, you have the multi-tiered ones where um, if you had a dog, Fido could drink from them. You could refill a water bottle, that kind of thing. And it actually becomes quite complicated in terms of the water access and, um, and getting them in there. So I'm not under an illusion that we're going to be able to recirculate all of them and it's going to happen overnight because there's going to be some capital costs, but I do think some prioritization around some of the more significant ones makes sense. Um, and with respects to a bit of sense of balance of maybe one or two, a couple in each neighborhood uh, so that, you know, people across the city can enjoy them makes a whole lot of sense. I'm hopeful that that's what's going to come out of this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. Um, ha happy to support this and appreciate Anthony coming out to talk about the importance of the Howard Street Fountain and indeed those water features and, and, and trees and all those kind of cooling uh, effects are so uh, important for our well-being as, as you've all articulated and, and I definitely appreciate that. I guess the one piece I find lacking in this motion and this is not a, a, a critique because I know our staff will come back with that thorough analysis of, around the, the climate lens and I think when we look at a lot of these Fountains, you know, uh, this centenary fountain, uh, you know, the fountain that we used to have in the art gallery where maybe one of us went through a box of Mr. Bubble, just saying, Mike. Um, but, but all these fountains, these, these iconic fountains that we used to have, uh, you know, that was at a time when uh, 
the Coquitlam Glacier was still intact and we, we weren't worrying about climate change. And indeed, you know, I just saw a really frightening video about Lake Mead in uh, Nevada and just how low the water levels are there. And in thanks to things like just egregious use of swimming pools and fountains and all the things that Las Vegas is known for, sucking up all this water and, and, and not having sort of a realistic perspective on the, the, the very clear and, and present danger of climate change and what that's going to mean for things like water features. So I appreciate that there is an articulation of, of why we need to get into this, the, the, the recirculating features. And, and I'm hoping that out of this we'll have a really more kind of thoughtful conversation and recommendations from our staff about water fountains of the future. What, how do we get these water features that make our lives so much better but recognize that water is a precious and finite resource and we are going to have increasing struggles with it in the not too distant future and I think that's something uh, that I look forward to seeing back so on that happy to support this motion and thanks Peter for bringing it forward. Okay, thanks uh, Councillor Fry. Um, okay, um, seeing no one else uh, on the queue, um, I'd now like to call the vote. Um, Clerk, if you could please take us to the voting panel, and Council, if you could please uh, register your vote. Okay, motion carries. Uh, with Councillor Carr absent, Councillor Dominato absent, Councillor Bly absent, Councillor Boyle absent, and Mayor Sim absent. And that concludes the last item on the agenda. Uh, the standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete, and we will now convene in council with Acting Mayor Joe as chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's committee meeting. Hey, thanks, Councillor Meisner. So we will now convene in the council to deal with the recommendations and actions for today's uh, and yesterday's standing committee on policy and the strategic priorities meeting. Uh, Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Uh, Mayor Sims on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Carr on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Dominato is on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Bly is uh, absent for personal reasons. Councillor Boyle is absent for personal reasons. Councillor Fry. Sure. Councillor Montague. Councillor Klassen. Sure. Councillor Meisner. Present. And um, Acting Mayor Joe in the chair. Present, yeah. You have quorum, Acting Mayor Joe. Thank you, Clerk. So we need a motion to adopt the standing committee recommendations for item 1 to 13. So moved. Moved by Councillor Carson, seconded by Councillor Montague. All those in favor say yeah. Yay. Opposed say nay. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, now we need, would like someone to move a motion to adjourn the meeting. Uh, Adjourned by Councillor Montague, seconder. Second. Seconded by Councillor Klassen. Okay, all those in favor say yeah. Yay. Opposed say nay. Yay. This motion carries unanimously, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.